Hello and welcome to An Evening with Nirvana, a podcast where I'm talking to a series of guests from the Dune community, some people from outside it, about level design, map creation, and uh, other facets of game development. Today I'm talking to Sandy Peterson, the man behind most of the levels for episode 2 and 3 of Doom, 17 levels for Doom 2, and 7 levels for Quake. You may also know him for his work on the original Civilization, or as a lead designer for Age of Empires 1, 2, and 3, as well as their expansions. He's also worked on Halo Wars, uh, and a number of other games. He's also got uh, board game series that he's worked on, which he's currently working on. Uh, which we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll touch on as well. Uh, it's super exciting to have one of the members of the id team on the podcast, so uh, welcome, Sandy Peterson. Welcome! I mean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is Sandy Peterson, and I, I'm uh, flattered, to, but also have to say you did a, a fine job of seeing uh, what I'd done in the video field. Yeah, well, it's great to have you on. Very exciting. Uh, and you... Yeah. Uh, I suppose, like, obviously I already knew about your work on Doom and, and Quake, and, and I was familiar with the fact that you'd worked on Age of Empires, but uh, I didn't realize, like, you had worked on all of the Age of Empires titles up to three and, and all their expansions. Uh, I also didn't know you worked on Halo Wars, and, and I was a big fan of that yes. game. So. And and I even did a tiny bit of work on um, uh, uh, Age of Mythology. Probably less on that than... Uh than the others but yeah i did work on i was even lead on some of the age of empire series and yeah, before yeah. that microprose software where i worked with sid meyer on um civilization though i was not one of the leads obviously and on uh you know sid meyer's pirates and things like that yeah so just a ton of uh different franchises that are have become very well known today and I, and I was actually a big fan of age of mythology i, I loved that game uh, I really liked the different graphical style to the other games. And, yeah, that was yeah. that was our um, our response to StarCraft. Interesting. Basically, see, what happened is that um, so Warcraft comes out, and uh, uh, Bruce Shelley, who who was the face of Ensemble Studios, said we should do a Warcraft, except use um like real ancient civs, like historical ones, that would be super cool. Yeah. Who, who wouldn't rather be like a Roman or a samurai than, a, than an orc, right? So mm -hmm. that was the idea. And so, of course, it was misunderstood. That, you know, oh, it's a cross between civilization and Warcraft. And it's not at all. It's, it's Warcraft, except, you know, a different setting. It's not, it's not civilization. So, so then we did that, and it did really well, as you know. And then some part way through um, Age of Empires two, here comes StarCraft, and we're like, "Whoa, look how asymmetrical these are! We're super jealous." And so, uh, and so, Age of Mythology was our attempt to respond to that and have three civs that were also really different. The way that basically we were kind of there was always a lot of penis envy between uh, uh, Ensemble Studios towards uh, Blizzard, and so. Although now Blizzard has kind of fallen upon sad times, it's not. I don't respect it anymore. But in the day, it was pretty great. Yeah, I mean they they've had some very iconic games, obviously. Uh, some of the most iconic oh, yeah. games. So it really. yeah, stands to reason. That I, I in fact, I was assigned to work on a game, which I guess the best way to describe it is Pirates Diablo, an ensemble. So it was going to be like a historical Diablo, except you know with pirates. Oh, but that got canned. Sadly, and then we were then we decided we loved World of Warcraft so much um, that we were going to do a, uh, a it, was, it was codenamed Titan. You might have heard of it. It was going to be a uh, huge MM, science fiction MMO set in the Halo universe, and uh, uh, that was going to be our approach to uh, uh, a response to uh, uh, World of Warcraft. Set in the Halo we, universe, you said. What? It was it sort of. It was set. In, are you very familiar with Halo? Oh uh, yeah, very. Yeah, I've played a okay. lot of that game. Okay, excellent. It was set before the Halos went off in the distant past. The humans oh, okay. are actually with the forerunners. The humans, yeah. the forerunners, yeah. but the, but the covenant is still around. Okay, and uh, the idea is that when the Halos go off and exterminate all intelligent life more advanced than a squirrel, that. In some places, remnants survived here and there, like the humans, and uh, right. But we'd lost all the history, so no one remember. But there was actually so what what's going on in the Halo Titan universe 
is that the foreigners are obviously the dominant civilization, and they have taken it upon themselves to um, defend the universe against the flood. And the covenant is kind of like resentful that they're treated as second class, so they are sort of war with the with the foreigners. But you know, but the flood is the real menace. Anyway, we had yeah. this whole thing worked out, and I was in charge of making the background. It was all really great until Don Met- Don Metric messed it all up. Well, I mean, that does sound interesting. And I suppose they en- Bungie ended up developing Destiny. Oh, so I guess they always wanted to get into MMOs. Maybe that was sort of no, the original. I think I'm sure Bungie... I haven't played Density. I'm sure they did a fine job. We liked Bungie. We got along really well with them when we were working on uh, Halo Wars and uh, yeah. Titan. I definitely want to talk to you a little bit about that later on, but uh, I'll start us sure, off... I guess you uh, want to go to Doom Quake, right? Yeah, I'll start off with Doom. I'll sort of go chronologically through through um, your game history here, although beginning with Doom, and uh, maybe we'll touch on Civ a little bit later too. But um, I sort of usually ask my guests how they discovered Doom initially, like how they got into it in the first place. Uh, and I suppose with you, I'll ask how you got into Doom uh, and how you uh, met it initially and, and got involved with the team. How I got involved in video games. So or, how, or, how you got uh, introduced to Doom and and how you uh, got into id. Okay, so um, I was working at Microsoft Software, uh, and uh, uh, and I actually had played Wolfenstein, and I was super impressed by Wolfenstein. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so, sorry, so. Okay, so I'm playing Wolfenstein, I love it. And then um, the owners of uh, Microprose essentially go barking mad and destroy their own company. And um, and in doing so, the people started to be squeezed out, and I was squeezed out. And so I'm, I'm looking for a job, and a friend of mine uh, like says, hey, I know these guys in Texas. Uh, maybe they can get you a job. This is five months, this is five months into my not having a job period. So, um, so I go, I fly out to id and, um, got, uh, uh, it was interviewed and the way they interviewed, you know, and I found out later on that what they were doing at id is that, um, they basically, they were, they didn't want to have Tom Hall around anymore. They decided he wasn't doing what they wanted to do on doom. Um, and, uh. So they, I guess, I don't know if he wasn't dark enough, or he wasn't working enough, or he was, they didn't like his, I don't know what it was. It, you never can tell. It It was, I mean, it emotionally sometimes was like a bunch of eighth graders, you know. So John, Tom Hall is on the out. So they bring me in. And what happened is that John Romero and John Carmack had decided that the reason that Tom Hall wasn't working out for them is because designers were bad. And you shouldn't have designers on your games. Now, remember, this is very early on in the development of, of computer games. Yeah. Okay? When I, was, when I went to work for Microprose in 1988, it was the, a game de- a designer, a guy who only designed it, wasn't also an artist or a programmer, was a really novel idea. And at first they thought it on, at, um, <clears throat> on, at, uh, it's, at, sorry, at Microprose, that probably the best thing is to have just a programmer who could do them both, like Sid Meier. And the only reason we had designers is so we could use a designer with a programmer who couldn't design, and together they were, like, maybe as good as one Sid Meier. But it turned out that Sid Meier, though he could design, also always wanted to have a designer because designers are just really useful even to... Because the programmer has to do design, too, right? Anyway, so John Carmack and John Romero had decided that designers were bad. And remember, there weren't any such thing as a level designer yet. At least if there were, they didn't call them that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they didn't, they, there was no, there wasn't a word. And the artist, uh, Adrian Carmack and Kevin Cloud said, no, no, uh, Tom Hall isn't the right designer for us, but we absolutely want to have a designer. So they've been interviewing artists to see if they could do the levels for Doom. And they brought me in and said, and didn't tell me any of this backstory. I didn't know it was programmer versus artist over whether I'd be allowed to be here. I had no idea. And the, and the first thing I did was I kind of won over John Romero because we went to dinner and we were talking about, about games, you know, video games. Uh-huh. And John Romero was amazed because I was the only person he'd ever met who knew as much 
or more about video games than he did. Because John Carmack didn't really care about video games. Adrian Carmack didn't care about video games. John Romero was the big gamer, right? And, when, and right. when he and I were able to talk on the same level about video games, that really impressed him. So then, you know, he he kind of was on my side, I guess. I mean, this is after the fact I, le- I learned this. So, <clears throat> so then they have me do a level. And uh, do a level using, using Doomed, that's what they called it. And so I built a level, and in fact, it's level E, I think it's E2M6. Um, let me let me look do a quick uh, Google search and see if that's the one by looking at the map, and that's the one. It must be tough to remember with there. everything you made. It's called uh, Halls of the Damned, and yep. the opening the opening part of it that I the main part I made while they were still there was the very opening part. There's like a, a little door you open, and you go into a place where there's uh, you walk to get a goodie, and then the then the the slime rises up and poisons you, and you have to try to get out. And there's a a monster behind it. Anyway, that that's not the only part I did, but it was the opening hall part. Mm-hmm. And um, it turned out that what the artists had done is very little. They had one of them had made a spiral staircase, and one of them had made like a fountain, and that's pretty much all they done. And I, my, I'm sure my stuff didn't look as good as the artists, but I had a whole level with secrets and monsters and fights and a trap that kind of got you, and a puzzle you had to solve. And <clears throat> and basically they said, this is what we want for, our, for our, our games. So they hired me. Then I found out later on that there'd been this uh, opposition on the part of some of them. But, but, I, but I won them over, I guess. And that was a good thing. Not, I mean, yeah, for me too, but because it meant that then later on they got other designers doing design. You know, And then companies as a whole had other experiences like this. I'm sure it wasn't just id. And so all over the industry, people said, yeah, designers are a thing we want to have. Mm-hmm. And we became a real thing. And then because what we mostly did was level design on Doom, and Doom 2, they started calling us level designers, so there we were. So I made the Doom level, and what had happened is that most of the levels were not done for Doom. Even though the game was very close to being finished, we had all the monsters, we had a lot of the rules... Things weren't textured. There weren't pits. So I had, I basically had to either make or remake 20 of the levels on Doom 1. And there's 27 levels. And some of the levels, I took a, a Tom Hall level and I fixed it up. Or even a, a level that a John Romero had worked on briefly and fixed it up. Some mm-hmm. of the levels were completely original. Uh, but but even the ones that I wor- worked with, something that Tom Hall started with, I had to texture everything. I had, I had to do... I'm not saying that Tom's influence isn't there, because it is, but I had to do a lot of work on it. And it wasn't Tom's fault, because, I mean, for example, when he was doing it, he only had like 20 20 textures, and then I had 200 textures. So he couldn't have done what I did, unless he'd been there when I was there. I was curious, because... I didn't realize they were getting rid of Tom Hall, either, when I joined on. It was a surprise when suddenly, after two months, he was gone. I said, where's Tom? And they said, oh, he left. I'm like, he did? They said, well, we forced him out. He did I had no idea, so I was not in the loop on a lot of things. I was definitely wondering because sure. you worked on a lot of the maps for episode two and three, and you and you famously completed a lot of Tom Hall's maps. Uh, yes. I was wondering when you were working on his stuff. Uh, like, what was the process of trying to like? Were you trying to iterate on what Tom Hall had already done? Uh, yes. or were you and trying to get to have- like a lot of your own flavor in there as yeah. a level designer as well? Yeah. So, so I was trying to keep the stuff that Tom Hall had that was cool. Which most of it was cool. He was actually, I mean, I, I respect him as a designer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I did, so, and some of the stuff he did was things that is not really in my wheelhouse. So, like, he had the unholy cathedral with, with the, the big fi- thing with the teleports going back and forth. Uh-huh. And that was like that kind of teleporting around. I, I think more linearly, that was really confusing to me. So, I just kept it kind of like it was, then worked on things that are on the outside of it to make it bigger and bigger. And then I put extra traps in, and I had to texture everything. Like I said, I had to put triggers in to move things. But the but the design part, the actual, I mean, putting triggers and texturing is kind of maybe that's not the most awesome part of design, though it is part of it. But making making sure the monsters are there, making sure they were doing things. I mean, Tom didn't even have access to all the monsters, right? You know, so I had to put all those things in. So it typically would take me. Um, it really took me the same length of time to do a Tom Hall level and fix it as it did one of my own. And that's partly not because Tom Halls were so bad I had to redo them, but because 
what I'm doing at Tom Hall level, I had to first understand what he was doing and yeah, try exactly. not to mess with it. So it was kind of awkward. So really, we I could have made them all be just mine and erase his, but I didn't because I wanted him to still have a a place in the game. So I guess yay me. I don't know. <laughs> As a sideline, I want to say that the other guys at id for a while were arguing that Tom Hall's name shouldn't be in the credits on Doom 1. I said, seriously? It's like, give him credit. It costs you zero dollars to give him credit. Mm. And it makes him feel good. And so they said, well, okay. And they Yeah, I credit. mean, he did the work, so... Uh, he did the work. What? I mean, I did more work than he did. But that's <laughs> well. because I was there later, right? Anyway, yeah, so we true. did all these levels. And so just before it's released, I get I took a trip back to Microprose, which was still in the process of falling apart under the, the burden of insane leaders. And I showed the guys I'd left behind... Um, Doom, and they were just blown away. Yeah, they never right. imagined something this cool could exist. And, uh, and so that was pretty satisfying. Yeah, I mean, you worked on... I feel like you worked on quite a few things that um, were innovative in interesting ways. Uh, but Doom... Well, thanks. Yeah, being... <laughs> being a sen- I mean, Wolfenstein, I suppose... And, then, you know, there were I other FPSs before. I, I just, it just made me want to work with its software. Yeah. I mean, that was the first that was the first first person shooter I really played. I mean it was one of the first ones ever. You know, and I thought I thought it was brilliant. And I loved the fact that in Wolfenstein, what it seemed to me was that every room was like a little tactical puzzle you had to figure out how to solve. So so I wanted to have that be the case in in Doom. I wanted the rooms to be little tactical puzzles. Mm-hmm. Uh, or well that's certainly puzzle. something that the game has like evolved into a lot more these days with community content. Uh, for sure. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. you had those yeah, ideas. Everyone able to make their own levels, then you can far surpass what what we could do. You know. And what sort of uh, basic guidelines did you have for episode two in terms of like themes and and textures to work with? Was that sort of laid oh, out by what Tom Hall had done, or was that like a... finished? When episode one finished, what was happening is that John Carmack and the programmers uh, were going to go and say, "Okay, we're going to do Quake now." And um, and so for the first for like the first year of doing Quake, or maybe not the first year, but first many months of doing Quake, um, there's not going to be any use really for much art or design because they're building the engine, right? Oh well, this was even Doom well, Two. I was uh, correct. I was talking about Episode Two of Doom One. Yeah. Oh, Episode Two of Doom One. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my. The original idea was that Episode One was going to be set on Phobos, the moon of Mars. Uh-huh. in a military base, then episode two was going to be in Hell, and then episode three was going to be on Dimos, the other moon of Mars, now infected by Hell. Or maybe I got Dimos and Phobos reversed, but that was, the, you know, one of those. That's and I said, I think Hell should be worse than a human place infected by Hell, because Hell is the ultimate evil. So we switched those, and then I basically took all the levels that had been made with me and um, uh, and I didn't worry about uh, John Romero's levels, because his were all on episode one. Yeah. So I just had to worry about the levels that I had done or finished, which for episodes two and three, and I arranged them so the levels that seemed um, more scientific were in episode two, and the more hellish ones where I really let myself go nuts were episode yeah three. And, uh, sometimes it, it would make John Carmack mad because I had these oh I kept making these open vistas where he could see things a long ways, and he hated that because it made his engine chug. Yeah, he wanted the engine plane overflows and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's what can I say? That was always the thing. And then the other play, then John John Romero would see it, and he'd like, I want to make a level cool like that. And and um, but of course, John when John Romero did it, it, it like he would all it was always looked better than mine. But uh, but I was proud of it several times he wanted to. Also, John Romero then started in Doom Two started to do actual deathmatch levels, which I never did. I because I felt someone had to do the for single player levels. And John Romero was doing great deathmatch levels, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had it, was... it covered. Uh, did you I have any say in, like, the the music that was chosen for maps, or did, did Bobby Prince handle all of that separately? Bobby Prince hand, handled all that, and I don't know how if he played the levels or just plugged them in, you know? Okay, yeah, interesting. I mean, the, obviously, the, the music is fine, right, for what we had. Um, but well, what's I mean, going on in too is that is that the programmers are doing Quake, so the designers... 
are using old textures and monsters to make Doom 2 in the meantime for essentially a cash grab. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but that's what Doom 2 was. It was an attempt to get to get more money out of the Doom franchise. And also, for the designers and artists who were a chance to like maybe show how much show how our skills were. You know, so Improved, I ended up doing uh, 17 out of the 32 levels in yeah. Doom 2. Then Adrian Carmack and John Romero made most of the rest. I think Sean Green did like one level. He was he had he had other tasks. Um, you know, he wasn't slacking off. He just had other tasks. And really, John uh, Romero had other tasks too. So him doing less levels than me isn't because he was slow or bad at doing them. He had other jobs like yeah, maintaining Doom. Adrian, sorry, American McGee did less levels, but in his case, it's because he joined halfway through the project. So yeah. Uh, so you talked about sort of wanting to make combat puzzles and stuff. Uh, maps like Refinery in, in Doom 1, they have like quite a lot of monsters compared to a lot of the other Doom 1 maps. And I've heard you say that you enjoyed using large groups of monsters. I, here's the thing. Doom 3, which I regard as the worst game in the Doom franchise, um, has really beautiful maps in which you're maneuvering and planning and looking at the lighting and fighting basically one single monster. I mean, that's an exaggeration by a little bit, but that, it's not, I wish it was further off than it is, mm -hmm. you know? And I think it's fun to kill lots of monsters. I remember after Doom 2, when we were kind of Quake, Serious Sam came out. Yeah. And, and it really showed how bad it had fallen. Not from Doom 2, but from the... the actually, it, was, it came out when we were looking at doing Quake 2, and there's a lot of... Some people on staff saying, we should have only a few monsters and have these giant, huge levels. That, and I was like... And then Serious Sam, I said, look at Serious Sam. That's fun. Nobody wants to have a giant fight against one monster. You want to kill lots of monsters, so, you know. Did you have... Uh... Were there, like, monster counts oh, per map that out. you had to adhere to uh, when you were working what? in it? For, for Doom? What about, what about it? Did you have, like, a monster count, for instance? Like, you weren't allowed to exceed uh, certain amounts of monsters for, for maps, like, in, in, in early parts in of the episode? In theory, we did. Mm -hmm. um, but in practice, the computers kept... Basically, part of the thing was, this is in the mid-90s, right? So computers are actually getting better visibly every year so the computers that we originally are making it for at the start of doom 2 aren't the same computers people are going to play it on so we never really got hit hard for that by the time of quake it was starting to hit us some of the quake levels i had so many monsters that it was actually jogging and you can see when there's too many monsters in doom because when there's too many monsters then the um the jibs start going away basically here's the thing so the game doesn't actually generate all the monsters necessarily at the start. They might, they're kind of spiritually there. But uh, as you, but, uh, and if you actually kept every single monster alive as you moved around, probably some of the monsters would, would clog or stop moving. But if you kill them, then they just leave a body behind. And you can see the corpses vanish when we run out of space for monsters in Doom 1. Yeah, I think that's the sprites why... used to sort of flicker in and out a lot uh, in vanilla from memory. Yeah, I mean, at least that's what John Carmack told me. I'm not a programmer. But he said, yeah, that if we run out of monsters... So the idea was if you're playing Doom 1 properly and you're shooting monsters, then you'll never run out of monster space because unless I put a thousand monsters in a single room, which, you know, which they, we, it was weird. Instead of saying, here are the rules, don't break them, they would wait. And when you got did something too far, they go, oh, you went too far. But they didn't oh, actually okay, tell right. you where the boundary was. Yeah, so yeah, I was sort of curious not, if there were boundaries. It was actually not a yeah. super effective way of doing it, because we didn't really have any kind of project manager. Mm -hmm. right? John Carmack was the guy, he was clearly the alpha male. right? He was the silverback. But he didn't want to manage the artists and programmers. His idea of managing was to walk up to one of us and say, hey, I got a new way of doing lighting. You should use it. And then he'd walk away again. And then we try his new way of doing lighting, and it was amazing because John Carmack was an amazing programmer, you know. And John Romero was in, th and John Carmack thought John Romero was in charge of the project, and John Romero like wasn't in charge of the project. He just did whatever he wanted, which is fine, you know. So we ended up we all were kind of doing whatever we wanted. There wasn't any. It's like it's like a whole country with no president, <laughs> right? No Interesting. So it was. So it was kind of it was. Only the fact that the people that worked there were so hardworking and so smart and able to succeed. Yeah. Everyone there was really hard, everyone was smart, and everyone got along up until Quake. 
Right, yeah, I'll definitely touch on Quake. Because uh, <laughs> I'll have to talk about that. Uh, so, you sort of... Um, you you seem to like making larger maps with it, like interesting progression and stuff. Um, was exploration something that you felt was an important part of Doom when you were uh, designing levels for it? Yeah, I thought exploration was fun. Um, and that's part of the reason I, I tended more towards single player than multi. I mean, I liked multiplayer, obviously. Um and I would go back to my maps and do things to give them more multiplayabilities, like um, level uh, E2M, I think it's E2M3, uh, uh, the refinery. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. a couple, there's a couple sniper windows in walls I put in there to make the multiplayer more fun. Mm-hmm. So what that do you think there. are the core aspects what? of like what made a good Doom map in your mind back then? Okay, what I like in my new maps is I um, I like you to be surprised when you come to an area. I like you to to have, feel trepidation. I, w- I want you. I don't want you ever to just. Why well, I say surprise? I don't want you ever just like, oh, there's a monster there. I never want it to feel unfair when you're attacked or killed. Yeah. I want you to feel like you were killed and it's your own damn fault. So, for example, if you're moving to an area and there's a giant poster of a demon on the wall, I would put that where there were scary monsters that could kill you. So is that yeah. made it more ominous? You knew something was up. Or there was the famous thing I would do repeatedly is that you'd go into a room and there was like a BFG or something on a pillar with a spotlight on it that you wanted to get. And then, of course, you knew as soon as you grabbed it, all hell would break loose. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas John Romero was fine. Just like suddenly teleporting monsters in behind you is a surprise because he, 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 like, he was about adrenaline and I was more about like suspense. And right. it's not like one of, our, one of our ways is good and one is bad. We just had two different ways. And that's good because it meant that when you're playing Doom, there's these multiple different ways that are that you're coming at. Yeah, I you think know? suspense and adrenaline, like those are two things that I definitely associate with Doom. As well, a, the way I actually quality. designed the levels was I would start with one section and I'd do it until I kind of felt it was done. Then I'd go on to another section and do that till it was done. So sometimes that would wind back to the first section. I do something else there, and I just keep doing sections. And some of the earlier levels, like E two M six, you can actually see where I finished the section and started the next one. It's very distinctive. Later on, I got better at kind of you know covering my tracks. But uh-huh. uh, did but you yeah, jump like... between maps, or were you always a uh, start one map, finish one map? No, no. I would. I, I usually had had three to four maps going at the same time. When I got stuck on one map, I go to another one for a while. Then I go back to the first one. So when I say it was the four to six weeks to do a map, it was like a week to start the map out. And then if six weeks later, I'd be done, but I was doing other maps at the same time. Yeah, that's how I tend to do it as well when I make maps. So it's good to hear I'd that it thing And I see, I get an idea doing one of the other levels and I go, ooh, ooh, that's a good idea, but I can't really fit it here. Then I go back to a previous map and stick it in. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so you you sort of created all three boss monster levels for Doom. You did Phobos Anomaly, Tower of Babel, and Dis. Uh, what special considerations yeah. were there when you were making a boss map? Well, the consideration that I shouldn't have made that I did was that my theory, and I, this is a rule I put my on myself, because mm-hmm. I said we didn't have any rules. I said, because if you're killed in Doom, you reappear at the start with only a pistol, every level must be beatable starting with just a pistol. Yeah, of course. Of course. So, every single level I played starting with just a pistol. Mm -hmm. And and as a result, I thought the Spider Mastermind was a lot more dangerous than he is. (laughs) I was going to ask you about this, yeah. If you start with just a pistol, he's going to kick your butt. If you start with a rocket launcher, then he's not so tough. Now, this, now the cyber demon is about the same whether you have a pistol or not, because really early on in the cyber demon level, you get a ton of rockets and a rocket launcher. Yeah. So you never really have to fight him with a pistol. Or if you do, it's because you're trying to do some feat to put on YouTube, right? But uh, but the spider mastermind with his he, he, his weapon, by the way, is a chain gun shotgun. That's what he's shooting at you. Yeah, it's like a shotgun, and and it has this huge scatter and does all this damage. And and if you're running around trying to get the stuff, the level is built, so you have to run around the outside of the level while he's blasting at you. And it's pretty hard, but in retrospect, we should have expected that a lot of guys would not go into that level with just a pistol. And so he seems easier than the cyber master, the cyber demon, especially because he's so wide and sprawling, it's impossible to miss the guy. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. He looks great, but but he but but the cyber demon is churning, clanking sound, and then the three rockets at once. You know, doo, 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 doo. that was so awesome. And so we never really managed to pull that off for the Spider Mastermind. So I regret that. Yeah, I think a lot of people consider the cyber demon sort of the true the true boss. I cannot argue. I wish we could have made. The, I wish we had made. In fact, I like the cyber demon, the Cy- spider demon, so much that, that when we he didn't work out so good in as the boss of Doom Two, Doom One. I I made them make baby spider demons for Doom Two. So that's where the arachnid. <laughs> yeah, the arachnid. Yeah, yeah. Because I want to have more spider things. Uh, and really, if you look through the, my levels, there's several cases in Doom Two where I just throw you know spider demons in. Yeah, for sure. I definitely want to. There is one level in particular that I'll I'll uh, talk about with uh, Doom Two. But um, okay, the great thing is because he's shooting bullets and the um the spiders shooting plasma bolts. When he shoots, his then of course it always hits a bunch of his young. Yeah. Or her young. <laughs> I don't know if he's a boy or girl. But then they start shooting at him, and so they'll fight each other, and that's always a great thing. Because because yeah. the way the way John Romero did it, and and this John Carmack did it, and it's totally like. Like we, it wasn't planned. Uh, a monster's firebolt belongs to that monster. So when a imp shoots an imp with a firebolt, he's not mad. But if he shoots a cacodemon, then the cacodemon gets mad and fights back. Yeah, exactly. But bullets don't belong to anyone. So when a zombie shoot, shoots a, a uh, imp with a shotgun, it gets mad and attacks him. But if a zombie shoots a zombie with a shotgun, they both get mad and they shoot each other. Because they don't know who it yep. belongs to. Mastermind's very infamous for fighting each other and, uh, yes. and ignoring yes, the players. <laughs> that, was, that was all, like, found footage, so to speak. It wasn't in the plan. It just, it just happened magically. Yeah, one of the and happiest the, accidents well, in gaming, I think. The whole boss level about it in, in, uh, in Doom 1, right? The whole secret level is based on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so with episode three, uh, you had a lot more maps that were just your own, uh, only having, I think, two from Tom Hall that you worked on. Uh, did yeah, you get to really set the style and theme for that episode? Well, it was supposed to be hell. You're supposed to yeah. be in hell. It's supposed to be raw chaos. So I have levels where the ground is all glowing lava. Well, you've, you've seen it. You know what it's like. Yep. It's supposed to look really weird and hellish. That's the idea. Uh-huh. And then in Doom 2, it wasn't really coherent. What what happened is John Romero was supposed to be in charge of Doom Two and organize it and do all this. I mean, I had kind of done it for Doom One, or actually Tom Wall, Tom Hall had done it for Doom One. He kind of set up the basics that I just kept with that, and then everyone kind of went along. I wasn't trying to take over; just someone had to do it, you know. And then then on Doom Two, John Romero was supposed to do it, and in, instead he just made levels, which is probably a better use of his time, really, because he did great levels. Yeah, but uh, but we didn't really have any kind of organization. There's no coherence. The only coherent thing we had is that John Carmack came to me and said, "I think that the secret levels for Doom Two should be the secret levels from Wolfenstein." Right. <laughs> and so they were. That's that. That was his input. Well, uh, certainly made for interesting secret maps. It did, and, and and so if you play Wolfenstein, you know how to find the secrets in it. He also, John uh, Carmack also said, no new monsters for Doom 2, but we managed to sneak a couple in anyway. Uh, quite, we quite get a few, easy. actually. I did yeah. fighters in, because he kind of had them, and I was able to get the, um, the, the Mancubus and the, uh, the Revenants, because we already had the art for it, we just hadn't put them into Doom 1. And then I was able to get the Pain Elemental, because it was a floating monster with no legs, so it was super easy for the artist to do the sprites, so it didn't delay them. Right, yeah. Well, he has little arms that move like he's walking too. So yeah, he doesn't have little arms, but <laughs> but but you can't, but it's, it didn't count and make it hard to do. So, but we also, I mean, so that's why our boss monster is so retarded. You know, the uh, the face on a wall. I mean, we just I, we it's a texture, right? It's because that's all we were allowed to have. Yeah. So, uh, so back so. Sort of... The funny thing is, we, so here's Doom Doom Two, which which is totally the poverty. That, like it's the ghetto doom because it's only that we 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 have to pull teeth. John Carmack won't do anything on it because he's on Quake, and John Romero would only do a little bit because except for doing levels because he doesn't have time to do. That. So we're, we're all doing this level with with no with only the existing resources, and then it like vastly outsold Doom One. So mm-hmm. it, it, like 
It had less resources and made far more money. Often happens with uh, sequels, yeah, for sure. Well, in that case, I think it's because Doom 1 was... Uh, actually, there was more copies in people's places, but it was all pirated. Doom 2, you couldn't pirate yeah. as easily because it was sold in stores. I guess a lot of people also might have just gotten the shareware and never never upgraded. Yep. Well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it yeah, sure is the case. Back to Doom 1. Um, with Sloth of Despair, was <laughs> was that map always intended to be shaped like a hand? Or did that stem from like the natural geometry and then you just connected the dots? All, it was always... Okay, the very opening part where you come down the stairs... Yeah. When I started doing that, then I said, hey, let's make it shaped like a hand. And okay. so I did. So yeah, that was my idea from the start. Uh-huh. Uh, you talked a bit earlier about how you went sort of wild with uh, episode three. Uh, and your texture work is often a lot more abstract than other id members. What was your philosophy in, in terms of texture use? Like what? My, my philosophy in terms of... Te- Here's the thing. I, uh, my philosophy in, in terms of, of textures was that American McGee and uh, John, Car- John Romero were like way better at um, composing... Um, uh, pleasant looking images using the textures. I just relied on the artist to make me a cool texture, then threw it in I, um, and hope for the best. So I didn't try to compete with the other guys. I would just make my, make my levels. But my rule was that there was always a hint about where a secret was. It was uh-huh. ne- you never had to go around and bump on all the walls. Shoot. There was always a hint. So famously in um, the Slew of Despair, there is an arrow that you can only see in the mini map that points right towards the secret door. Right. Yep. <laughs> the so famous means- arrow. I think there are some in yeah. uh, is it downtown as well. A couple of arrows. Might be. Well, the one downtown you can actually see though. Yeah. The, the one in uh, Slew of Despair is invisible. It's only in the mini map. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. But, uh, but uh, well, I put the stupid arrow in. Everyone hates my arrow in, in downtown, but I put the arrow in because John Romero was like, I don't know where to go in this level. It's too big and open. I can't figure it out. So I put an arrow just like, go here. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a good start. And then I got mocked for it because I put the arrow in. <laughs> I couldn't win. <laughs> uh, um, but so- remember that, that downtown was the first open level where, there was, where you weren't just going through hallways and stuff. It was like there was no you had no idea what it was. You're kind of on your own. Yeah. You're in a city, and uh, and that's where it was. So it was. I regard it as a big success level. Basically, John Carmack hated it because you could you could see it, it you could see all the geometry and it clogged his engine. But everyone else loved it. So yeah, no, it's definitely an iconic map. Uh, so <laughs> you seem to like environmental hazards. In your maps, you like crushes, damaging floors, things like that. Uh, are you somebody who tends to like sort of oppressive environments in video games, or, or not necessarily? So here's the thing. Um, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in 1973 when it first came out. Mm-hmm. So by the time I went to work at ID, I'd been playing role-playing games like D&D and other things for like 20 years. And of course, what do you have in a dungeon map? There's traps, and there's pits, and there's poison needles, and there's monsters. Yeah. So I just used that kind of ethos in it. Mm-hmm. I thought, monsters are cool. Isn't it also cool if the player is scared because there might be a, a pit? And then I thought, pits are cool. What if there's a combination of a monster and a pit? That would be even cooler, right? And so I just kept kind of uh, expanding on that. Just to have, you know, that was yeah. my idea. It definitely creates stories, too, like... I was playing and, and I great. got crushed <laughs> right at the end of the level or whatever. Well, sure. And then, of course, the cool thing is so I set up a lot of the traps so that you could sometimes use them to kill a bad guy. You yeah. know, I mean, every person that managed to crush a spider mastermind with a lowering ceiling just feels like a genius, you know? Because yeah. I'm all about having players feel like geniuses. Mm-hmm. Got to empower the player. With your level design. I think sure. the stupidest thing any designer can do is when he tries to make the player think that that he, the designer, is smart. I don't want the player to think I'm smart. I want the player to think he's smart. Because if the player thinks that I'm unfair, he thinks I'm a jerk, he doesn't want to play my game. He thinks that he's brilliant, and he figured out this thing that I never would have thought of, even though I might have. Who knows, right? Then then he lost my game, and he's playing it. So, Because I'm, I'm, I'm not about my ego. I mean, obviously, I'm a game designer. I've done a lot of games. I have a huge, colossal ego. I just try to pretend that I don't, so I, people can get along with me. But... Um, <laughs> 
Yeah. But the fact is that 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 I don't want to inflict my. I want the players to feel like the hero, like they're the genius. That's always the. Yeah, it must uh, be a that, tricky balance. I want them to have fun. They have more fun if if they think they're brilliant, and um, that's why like. Jumping and landing on the exact pixel in Mario isn't as fun for me because every time, every time you feel doing that, you feel like like the designer was a jerk, right? You don't feel like it's your fault. <laughs> Nobody could have made that jump, but but when you uh, when you trick the Kaka demon into fighting the Cyber Demon in in John Romero's level in Doom Two, you know, in his big boss fight thing, then you feel like a genius. Sure, John Romero planned it. But you right. benefit. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, you. It does kind of make you think like, oh, I've gotten one over on the designer here when, when really, uh, they planned it all along. And then you get the great story. Then the fact that we purely by accident had multiplayer gives you even more stories because our humans are far more deceitful and evil and treacherous than a computer can ever be. So all the best Doom stories are from those those multi fights. You know, <laughs> it's true. I, you sort of so touched on. Here's a fun fact about those those fights. Uh -huh. So there was a so there was a level of um, that Tom Holland started that I completed, which had a, a level an area that had boxes. It wasn't E two M three. I can't think which one it was. And there and there was a, a box pile there that if you sat on top of it, people had to go through this this one big room where there was that box pile in the corner. Uh -huh. And whenever you did, then John Romero was always on top of the boxes, shooting you with his rocket launcher, so you <laughs> die. So it sucked. So like. People didn't want to go in that room anymore. So you'd listen from the from the other room if you if you thought John might really listen until you heard him jump off the boxes. Of course, <laughs> course when you jump, you hear a little oof. Then you'd go in, right? <laughs> so John Romero got a bunch of us <laughs> because he learned that if he turned to the wall and he pushed on the wall, it made an oof that sounded a lot like when you jumped off. Yeah. He did that. Then we all ran into the room and he blew the crap out of us. <laughs> so we were like. You're a bad man, John. He said, "Like he hit you." Yup. Yeah. Well, so he you know, would never do that. He was notoriously kind of the the king of deathmatch around the id office. Mm -hmm. Um. Every time I killed him, I felt good. <laughs> so you touched on uh, unholy cathedral, and and it's interesting to hear that Tom Hall was the one who set up the sort of strange teleporter progression uh, beforehand. I was. I, I suppose you wouldn't have known if there was sort of planning that went into that. Like, did you often plan your maps beforehand, or was it all yes. pretty naturally I built? I plan my maps beforehand. Okay. Not always. For example, the map, I can't think of it. You remember the one that looks like a heart and lungs and a stomach? It looks like guts. Oh, not off the top of it. my head, no. It's a, it's a level where there's, where the floors look like lung tissue, kind of. And there's monsters in 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 uh, under like in pits that get raised to the surface, and there's two big sections that look like lungs. And um, someone who's is, uh, who's very familiar with Doom One right now is screaming. I can hear them. I know. I can't believe I can't think of my own damn level. I feel really em embarrassed. Um, well, oh, here it is. Oh. It is House of Pain. Oh, it is in fact House of Pain. Okay. It is in fact House of Pain. So if you look at the House of Pain, oh, I forgot that I went and did a whole bunch more stuff later on in it. But the but the first part of the House of Pain has lungs and a stomach, and then uh -huh. it goes into the rest. Of right. And uh, and I I just remembered that because early on in the House of Pain, it was all that part, and I spent most of the time just having that part. Then later on, I said I need to have more, and then I made all this other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It's E three M four House of Pain. Yeah, and uh, so that was all plan, like pre planned. Did you did you sketch stuff out on paper? Was that how you pre planned, or or was this just in your head? I was sketching things out on paper. Yes, uh -huh. um, not always. Like Mount Erebus, I didn't sketch it out on paper because I literally wanted it to feel like a random house, like a nightmare. Basically, it was a, it was a hellish like a hellscape with lots of haunted houses. Right. Yep. That's the idea, right? Mm -hmm. And um. And then uh, I'm sure that the Unholy Cathedral, which was primarily um, uh, Tom Hall, had been planned out more. I added a bunch of stuff on the edges of it, but uh -huh. the main central thing was all him. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, definitely one of the most unique in terms of uh, how it progresses. Yeah, 
And then you had to go through the teleporters in different orders, and uh, it always got me confused, so I just didn't touch what he had. But then I added all the stuff around the edges for more things. So mm-hmm. the little the little extra rooms, were, those were all mine. Just the central thing was his. Right, yeah. And, uh, what was the concept behind... And Pandemonium was also largely his. Which one, sorry? Pandemonium E3 M3. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what was the concept behind Warrens uh, and making the player sort of play through uh, map one again, essentially, but with uh, it, some it surprises? Prank. The idea was that the players would go to the... would would reach the secret level, right? Wait, yeah. is it the boss level or the secret level? It's, it's the, the secret, secret level, right? Level, yeah. Okay, what would happen is they'd go to the secret level and and it would look exactly like E3 M1. Mm-hmm. It would say, hey, this is E3 M1. What the heck? I have to start all over again. Then you go through it, and it stayed like E3 M1 until you got... Wait, is it E3 M1 or is it... um, Yeah, it's E3 M1. M1. And 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 it'd be just like it until you got to the very end, and suddenly you heard the Cyber Demon. And (laughs) then, behind you, all the walls come down, and when you go back, it's all different. So it was completely a giant prank on the player. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> how did that go down it, originally my secret levels, I gotta say this all my secret levels are intended as pranks right because I don't think a secret level should just be another level I think it should be something like really fun that's why the secret level in uh, in episode 2 is is you know the fortress of mystery is this crazy ass thing where you where you have to get the monsters to fight each other yeah because we just discovered you could do that and so it was really funny and uh, and I and early, we had our playtesters going at how could you beat this level? There's all these monsters. I can't possibly beat this level because they because they hadn't learned how to make the monsters fight. And of course now a modern Doom player would just laugh at me. But at the time it was pretty great. And then Warrens, if you go into it not real, like it looks like like this the 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 start level. It's yeah. all made to look exactly like it. So you're supposed to remember the start level and like be huh. I wonder what's going on. And then when you find out what's going on, of course, it's, it's glorious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's a good reveal at so. the end. And then, then in, 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 uh, uh, in Doom 2, of course, my secret levels are directly based off of the, uh, the Wolf of Time levels, yeah. except again, I go beyond that, and there's other things in there. I have like, basic idea is you go into it, and there's cracks in the Wolf of Time level that lead to Doom. Mm-hmm. It's like, universe. so that was the idea there. Whereas uh, John Romero, I'm not saying he's less of a man for doing this, but but his secret level is kind of just another level. And really, it's because he had done this extra whole level that was really cool, and it didn't... And so he had one too many levels, so we said, we gotta use this level, so we put it into E1M9. Right, yeah. And I think that was the right choice, because it's a great level. Yeah, great level, great MIDI. That was yeah. Um, yeah. So... Uh, on to Doom 2, uh, you've talked about how you sort of requested certain monsters, like the Hell Knight, to be made uh, for the game. Uh, what was the process like for creating monsters and then and then balancing them? Did the designers well, yeah, have a hand in yeah. that? Or? When I made a monster, here's the thing. So the monsters I would make, uh, if I could, I'd try to make it so that it was only a little bit of art time. So like the Hell Knight was the easiest thing ever because it was just a texture change. Yeah. Right? So it was just like... A washed out night so so john carmack wouldn't care because the whole thing remember is is not about following the process or having a plan it's about trying to not go too far so that nobody would say you were bad right i mean it's a hell of a way to run a company but like i said when you have a whole b- bunch of like really smart guys who are really hard working you can kind of get away with it. Mm-hmm. So, so but but it is why it isn't owned by it anymore right so that, that that process can only really carry you so far. Um, so sure. what I would do is I'd go to the artists and say, and and, and I, I would and I would say, hey, we want we already have the art for the mancubus and the um, uh, I think we were given we they said they could do one new creature. Okay, so our argument was this: we said we already have the revenant. We have a physical model of the revenant, which we did. That we can rotate and get pictures of, so it's already kind of done. So we got free, right? Yeah. And uh, and then we didn't ask permission; we just assumed we got it free. And then the the creature they made from whole cloth was the mancubus. Mm-hmm. They just made him from scratch. But he was so cool. And then John Carmack kind of got interested in him, so he gave him his special ability, which is, as you know, he shoots to your left, then he shoots to your right, then he shoots in the middle. Yeah. 
So that was like about as much programming as he was going to do. I mean, you know, it was pretty basic stuff. And then I had to fight for the Arachnotrons, and I managed to get them in. Um, they, 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 really, I kind of had to slide them past uh, John, John Carmack because he probably would have vetoed it if we'd asked him if he, he wanted to or not. The paint elements were easy because they didn't have a walk animation. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, let's see what else did I add in that. Uh, that might be it. Oh, I did have the paint animals blow up and give out the. Oh, uh, and there was the. Uh, we had two new monsters because we had the Archfile. Yep, the Archfile. And the Archfile was fabulous. And that was a direct case of John Carmack coming in to do something. Yeah, it definitely seems that said, way because it's a very interesting monster uh, mechanically. So John Carmack came in and he said, hey, you know what? Um, a corpse remembers what kind of monster it was. We said, it does? And he said, yeah. So I said, so we could, and then he says, so you can resurrect it. It's like, this is a really good idea for a new monster. And John Carmack, who could recognize a good idea, right? He was like, let's do it. So that's what the Arch, so basically the Archfile doesn't, he just wanders around randomly. And if he bumps into a corpse that knows what it was, then he'll resurrect it. Not every corpse knows what it was. Like if you jib it, so it's only a puddle of, of, of bones, it doesn't remember anymore. But if it's, but if it's a, a still intact corpse, then it knows it was an imp or whatever, and you can resurrect it. Mm-hmm. So if you blow a monster to jibs, it won't resurrect. Was there sort of a balancing period for the monsters where you sort of tested how they played in maps and, and stuff before you sort of actually started in using general, them? I was always on the side of making monsters be more horrifying and more terrifying because I figured players would learn to deal with it. It's not the same kind of balance you would have to have if it was a deathmatch, you know, where players had to yeah. be equal to other players. Monsters can be as gross as they want. Just have, the only limit is I have to, like... It would not be fair to put you in a pit with, like, three arch files, right? Because then you just die. So, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I forget who came up with the idea of the arch files attack being kind of like the... It basically works a lot like the uh, BFG. You know, like, he has to have an mm. eyesight to you. Yeah, it's hit scan, uh, line of sight, yeah. Yeah. Um... And uh, so he liked that, and I liked that too. So also it was cool because it gave you a couple of seconds before it went off. I don't remember whose idea that was. It wasn't mine. Might have been, uh, might have been the artist saying, let's put fire on him first, then he'll blow up. And of course that was brilliant because because if, if it hits you, then you then you knew it was crackling and that was cool. And if you managed to get away just in time, you felt smart. So that was great. Right. And, so um, monster design was kind of a group make, thing. Like everyone would just come up with ideas. Guys and... trying to make the game as fun as possible. And also everyone was like, on point, pretty much. So, for example, I think I've told the story before, but the original idea for the Lost Souls was they were simply floating skulls in the distance that would, that would like, basically shoot darts at you okay. and be creepy. And it was, like, really boring. And uh, Adrian Carmack said, hey, I got a new idea for the Lost Souls. What if they're flaming fireballs that scream while they're flying at you? And that was, like, so much better than what I'd come up with. Everyone was like, that's the Lost Souls. Because it was great, right. and also it didn't lead to a cool tactical thing, which is that they often killed you if you had the rocket launcher. <laughs> yeah, so ideas would just come from anyone on the team, really. Anyone on the team could have an idea, and 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 there was no person who was who who had who like had was the giant ego idea man that had to reserve his own ideas. We all just, that's part of the reason that a lot of these things I don't remember who came up with it because somebody somebody would come up with it, and we would all kind of. Oh yeah, that's great, and and jump on it and yeah, yeah. and use it. Uh, one of the few ideas I remember was absolutely mine. Was I came up with how the BFG should work, and the reason is because the the, the original idea behind the BFG was John Carmack said every every gun has two levels of, of its gun, right? And well, the shotgun didn't originally, but later on it did. So there's like the pistol and the chain gun, and there's well, I guess maybe they didn't all have two levels of monsters, but we only have two levels for the for the for the plasma gun. So we have the plasma gun and there's going to be the BFG, which by the way, canonically, and this was named by John Romero, is the big fun gun. That's so okay, if you're yeah. seeing a naughty word in there, you're just wrong. It's true. So big no fun naughty gun. words in Doom. It's, it's no naughty that. words in Doom. Um, <clears throat> Um, anyway, so so uh, John Carmack says, here's what it's going to be, and it sounded great on paper. He's going to fire a bunch of plasma balls, and they're going to be all different colors, like 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 uh, Christmas ornaments, and they're and they're going to be they're going to fly. Thousands of them are going to fly down the hall, and they're going to bounce off the walls and bounce off each other and go down there and flood the thing, and everything this way is going to get blown up. 
So it's going to be like this huge scatter shot of all these 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 uh, plasma balls. No shattered, great. So we're like, that'll be great. So we did it, and then it was like the least effective weapon ever. You had to be right next to someone for it to work, because it turns out that even if I have a thousand plasma balls and I shoot it at you at kind of a big scatter cast, that they're moving slow on like a shotgun, and it doesn't take very long before the scattering is so widespread that you're only going to be hit by three or four of them. Yeah. So it was just a terrible weapon. Um, and so we're like, ah, it doesn't work. And so the way we we used it in deathmatch cells work is you'd get the you get the BFG and you walked up right next to someone and then you'd fire all the plasma balls hit it and it would kill them. So really, it wasn't that much different from the uh, the super punch or the chainsaw. Um, right. Oh, chainsaw. It was not my idea. Uh, I think it was John Romero's, but anyway, everyone liked it. So, so what I, so I was, I was thinking about how terrible the, the BFG was and how nobody ever wanted to use it. And what I came up with was, back in the day, there was a video game called Defender, yeah. an arcade game. I don't know if you ever, if, I, it's probably like when you were only an embryo or something because yeah, maybe. I'm old and, <laughs> Bad. In Defender, there was a thing called a smart bomb, and when you shot the smart bomb, it killed every single enemy on the screen. It okay, was like yeah. this huge deal. So I said, what you want the BFG to do is be a smart bomb. So my idea was it would launch like a big garbage can looking thing into the middle of the room, and it would blow up with this huge radius and kill everything in the room. Mm-hmm. And uh, But the idea was that it's a thing that kills everything in the room. And then John Carmack took that along with John Romero, and they ran with it. And, of course, what they ended up with is, is much better looking and more interesting tactically than what I had thought of. But the idea that, it, that, it's, the de- that it's the smart bomb was mine. Yeah, the was spread mine. mechanic, yeah. And, so, and it was a completely different way of approaching the, uh, the BFG. Mm-hmm. And which, now which people can... Uh... Because now the BFG is cool, right? And it, and it had tactical yeah. things. Yeah, now you can kill a cyber demon in two shots with it. Well, yes, but if you're trying to fight me with it, then there's tactics I can use and you can use to make it better or worse, which is the cool thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it still uses, uses up all of your, uh, um, your, your, your plasma shots. Well, it's but only really, 40 per shot, so it's not too bad. Off with Pretty efficient. Yeah. Um, so in terms of making maps for, for Doom 2, uh, Entryway, the very first map, what went into creating, like, the first map of the game? Did uh, a lot of people have more input for something like that because it was sort of what the player would play first? Uh, were there specific rules or, or still uh, not really? Okay, we had rules in Doom 1. Mm-hmm. And the rules were that we weren't going to have the... Um, I'm trying to think when the Cacodemon first appears. Is there a Cacodemon in, Do- in the first episode? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I remember you saying that it was your map E2M1. I think E2M1 might be. There was, there was a specific map when we um, when we finally. It might be that. Might be E2M1. It is. It is E2M1. We decided not to have the Cacodemon until the first level of the second episode because we thought they would save. I don't know what they thought they, but they thought that they saved that right, and um. There, and that the uh, we would ramp up the monsters. So at first there was going to be just zombies. Then the imps were going to be next. Then there's going to be the the pinkies. Oh, and the invisible pinkies, the specters. That yeah. was John Carmack's idea. He said, "Hey, what if I give them a texture that's invisible, or just like pixelated?" And we said, "Oh, great!" So you know that's where they came from. Mm-hmm. Um, totally John Carmack. And of course, you know it was great. So and then. Um, We'll ramp up, and then there's going to be two bosses at the final level of Doom 1, and they were going to be the Bruiser Brothers. And yeah. so I made the rename to be the Barons of Hell, because Bruiser Brothers is, like, super retarded. But, uh... Um... And, uh... So, uh, no sort of so set that, rules that for rule a map one? one. What? That no was the s- rules for episode 1. Oh, for, so the first for map, map 1 of Doom 2, uh, I was talking about. Episode 1 was supposed to show... The, it was supposed to have. A, it had to have a glimpse of the outside. Had to have the zombies. Had to look like a space place. <clears throat> then it was supposed to be a surprise when you see the imp. And the imp is put up on a uh, on a platform when you first see him, so that his fireballs have to arc down to you, so you can tell it's three D. Right. 
and uh, there was a lot of things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. that well, that, the, uh, John, I sort of wanted to talk about Doom Two uh, here. Um, yeah, map map one of Doom Two entryway specifically. Okay, I don't think that's my map, is it? I thought it was. Oh, uh, wait, is it, it not? Is my map. It is totally my map. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so the idea behind the, the the rules on this map was that it would start looking like that, like Doom One, it would start in space then end in hell. But I wanted the hell to be more open, exciting hell. And also, it was John Romero had the idea that the chainsaw is behind you around the corner. So if you just jump off the uh, shelf and go kill the zombies, you won't have the chainsaw. Yeah, right. But if you went there first, you'd have it and you'd feel smart. Mm -hmm. um, I put it in kind of for John. So, yeah. So the rule was not too, compli not too complicated. Kind of introduce you to Doom 2. Uh, and, and also, there weren't any new creatures in it that I can remember. No, there kind aren't. Of, yeah. Kind of just let you, uh, you know... Go, uh, you know, go have fun on it. Yeah. And then in the underhauls, things started getting worse. I mean, here's the thing, okay? <clears throat> the uh, Doom Doom Two Map One was intended uh, to be the first map, and all the rest of the maps were just like after they were done. I had to put them all into an order of kind of easiest to hardest, but there's no actual structure. Okay. Right. Uh, so, what about things like weapon progression? Because you get in a secret in map one, you get the rocket launcher. Uh, if you find that secret. Yeah, I know. What, originally, the idea was that you would have this 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 progression of of weapons that would get more complicated, and that was supposed to be in Doom one too. But then John Romero loved having good weapons early on. So, like Doom one, the shot, the the chainsaw is supposed to be this big secret that almost no one will ever find. But of course, everyone like had it from the start yeah um and then they, and then they had me basically they said they i can forget who said now they said you should put a rocket launcher in, in doom 2 level one i said but it's the first level and they said yeah but they've already played doom one and i said well they might not have anyway so i gave him the rocket launcher but i put it in a secret so you couldn't just grab it <laughs> right uh so and you gotta remember also i'm still playing all the levels starting with just a pistol yeah of Me course. finding a finding a rocket launcher was kind of cool. It's not so cool if you save the game and you don't. You know, well, you get to keep it through all the levels, so it ends up being. I know, really useful. I know, which makes it not as cool. But it's just <laughs> more ammo, right? Yeah. That's so, you, every everyone listening to this, if you want to have the full Doom experience where weapons are as exciting as they should be, then what I suggest is that you start each level with a pistol. Then it will be like that. On the other hand. Maybe what we should have done, if we'd had an actual game designer for, for Doom instead of just a bunch of, like, a lead game designer, a bunch of, other, a bunch of, a bunch of equals, someone could have said, hey, weapons are going to wear out and you have to buy a new one. Oh, no. Except John Romero. Not, a, not in my it. Doom, Sandy. <laughs> no no uh, durability, please. That would be very well, I don't know how we do it. Maybe there could be, you know, I mean, the most hateful monster in uh, Dungeon Master was that little critter that runs up behind you and steals something and runs away. We could have someone like that. Yeah, something like an arch vial that just steals your weapons only. Uh, so map seven. Maybe every swap you fall into a pit and lose all your stuff and start again. Oh yeah, I suppose at the end of um, episode one, Doom one, the end of each episode you would lose your weapons. So sort of did that a little bit. Uh, map 7 of Doom 2, Dead Simple, very iconic map. Uh, I was curious what parts of that are American McGee, and what parts of that are, are you, if you um, I started out with it with a few things, and then American McGee took over and did the majority of making it fun. Right, okay. Did you so do layout he... work for it, or...? What? I started, and then American McGee ruled it. So, I'm happy with him getting the vast majority of the credit for that. Uh-huh. And was the, you know, the tag that uh, the 666 and 667 triggers that make um, the walls lower when the mancubuses die and the arachnotrons? Was that specially yes. requested for that map? That was me. Yeah. I did that. Uh huh. And w so why was that trigger not used sort of more for progression in other maps? Because it's only used in that one. There was a lot of 
triggers we didn't use very often. I guess we were always looking for novelty. Remember, you got to remember, here I am, I'm doing 17 levels at once, so sometimes I would forget that I had this cool trigger. <laughs> and then there was, like, lame triggers, like, like they made a trigger for Doom 1. I forget exactly where it is. It might be, I think it's the first episode, where they had this one door that starts open at the start of the level, and then in exactly one minute it closes, and then it stays closed forever. And somehow John Carmack thought that would be a cool trigger, and it got used that one single time. <laughs> yeah, there was, are a few things like that where it's just one yeah, one time. It just wasn't cool, you know. I think we should have had more things like you kill guys and, and the levels lower. Um, I agree that we could have exploited that. If only you had been there when we were making the level, <laughs> then it would have been yeah. good instead of terrible, like they were. Well, I was just curious because it's something that definitely happens, uh, like in a lot of other games. Things will be triggered by you know monsters dying and stuff, but but it's just in this one level in Doom. So it was interesting that you guys um. Uh, didn't think it was uh, interesting enough to sort of use across the game, I suppose. Well, I think it's more that we were always focusing on other things. We always, yeah. we're running, every, everything we're doing, we're trying to, we're doing 34 episodes in like five months. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in the meantime, we are constantly having art and effort and playtesting stolen away to do Quake. And near the end of Doom 2, we're actually trying to do Quake levels too. So <laughs> right. it was all the time, yeah. and then but th then it was un it was unreasonable. A lot of ways, like for example, um, like w once John Carmack came into my off into my office, he was all mad. He says, "Why don't you work long enough here?" I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Well, you leave at like eight o'clock at night. I'm here till three a.m. Right?" And I said, "John, when do you come in?" He says, "Well, I come in like two or three in the afternoon." I said, "Yep, I come in at eight in the morning." And he was like, oh, because he had no idea, right? He assumed that, that he, since he only saw me for five hours of the day, I was only five hours of the day. And But one great thing about John Carmack that I have sought to emulate is that if you made, if you were talking to him about something and he suddenly realized that he was wrong, he completely changed his opinion and sided with you on the spot. Everyone else has cognitive dissonance or tries to think of a reason why they're really right after all or stays mad, but not 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 Carmack. He had no ego investment in being wrong. As mm. soon as you, as soon as he realized, he would sometimes he'd be arguing with you about something, and halfway through he'd stop and he'd think and he'd think and he goes, "Oh, I see what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, that's right." So uh, I, I really admire that feature of John Carmack. Yeah, that is now, a very not, unique. You know, I mean, it's like part of the reason he could do it is because he was so weird, but um, you know, it was still cool. Mm. Uh, so sort of back to talking about the, the triggers that you had at your disposal, uh, was, was Tricks and Traps something you'd wanted to make for a while, or was it just sort of a, an excuse to play with the different I triggers? get out of my system. Yeah. Because everyone, because I had all these trap ideas that, okay, I'm going to get all the traps done, then I can just <laughs> focus on other things, because I had all these great ideas yeah. for little areas, and of course I have other maps that are like that. Really, Erebus in, in Doom 1 is kind of like that. So I, I have all the things right here at the start and finish them all, and then... But, of course, it didn't get out of my system. Mm -hmm. But that was the idea. Is that the sort of Dungeons & Dragons influence as well? It's very Dungeons & dragons -y, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have Barrels of Fun, which is basically a one-trick pony, right? I mean, Barrels of Fun, you just go in there and... Uh, uh, you know, and it's all about the barrels. Yeah. Well... I'm looking, I'm looking at the Doom Wiki, E3M2, where it says... Uh, the name may be reference to the sloth of Despond from Pilgrim's Progress, which of course it is. And it says it oh, uses the music track Donna to the rescue. Do you know who Donna was? No, I don't actually. Donna was the front desk lady. <laughs> oh, okay. She was at the time in her 40s or 50s, kind of chubby. She was great. Uh, everyone loved Donna. Well, she got a nod in the game, so... That's pretty cool. Um, map map nine, the pit. What were your goals for that in terms of level design? Was it sort of mainly to focus on verticality, which wasn't really used so much in Doom? Was that kind of the idea? Because it is like a very uh, vertical map. Which map were you talking about? Uh, the pit, map nine of Doom two. Oh yeah, the one everyone hates. Does everyone hate it? I think it's quite sort of iconic, but uh, it I mean, definitely... I, I don't hate it. Yeah. Um. But I but I've heard a lot of people complain about it. Um, uh. Yeah, map nine. 
Let me look. I, I, I remember which one it is. I just want to look at the uh, the the, the older map. map from above. Oh yeah. Wait. Wait, no, that's not. The... The... Is the pit the one with the narrow little walkways over the? Uh... No, no, that's the chasm. The pit's the, the one, cap, you yeah. start in the gigantic pit at the beginning and you go well, up a massive lift. It was and... my first day about making a lot of verticality. Yeah. Where there'd be a big hole in the middle and you'd be going up and down. Yeah. And I feel, I, I, I'm kind of unhappy with the way the pit turned out. I don't think it, in my head, it was cooler than, a, than, than the central part with the levels going up and down. It was cooler than it turned out to be. It was, okay. you know, I like some of the little side, ro side places you go into in it. But the uh, but the basic central hub, I feel, was kind of not as as great as uh, as it could have been. But by the time I I realized that maybe it needed fixing up, I had to do other maps, and so I said, "Well, it'll do." It's it's kind of interesting. There's no other maps like it, so I'll just I'll just deal with it. I had been sort of curious but, talking but, to you if this was maybe. Uh... Awesome. I really did verticality in that one. Yeah. I felt very proud. Of that map. Yeah, for sure. I'd sort of almost nope. wondered if this was another John Carmack, like, we need to show the engine how vertical it can be with the 3D. And... <laughs> um, if John Carmack said we had to have things going way up and down, I don't remember it, but this was 30 years ago, yeah, so I might not remember it. Um, um, really, John Carmack didn't come in very much in Doom 2 and demand things. He was um, busy with he Quake, was, I'd imagine. He was busy having fun with Michael Abrash making Quake. Right, yeah. I mean, essentially, John Carmack hired Michael Abrash to have someone to talk to while he made Quake, um, because <laughs> nobody else could talk about programming at his level, but Abrash could. But Abrash was actually a, a human being, unlike John Carmack, so that like you could hang out with him and go to lunch, and he wasn't like a weird alien monster like John Carmack. Strong I mean, words. I'm saying, this, I'm saying this loving John Carmack, but man, his personality was was. Well, it was John Carmack, you know. There's a lot of things about him I really, really admire. And there's really nothing about him I really dislike. It's like, it's like not liking John Carmack is, is a total waste of time because it's like saying that you don't like lizards or something, you know. It's, it's, it, he, he doesn't care. He's, he's doing his thing. But, uh... I mean, he definitely and, and seems he, very focused right, on the work, I think, when, I, when I've seen him. He's focused on the work, sure. yes. Which is great. And so, so it was pretty funny. We, we're sitting at lunch, right? There's all of us sitting there at lunch, and then Michael Abrash is drinking a beer, and he's talking to the... Well, not at lunch. We wouldn't drink, drink beer at lunch. In the evening, he'd drink a beer. We are talking and having a good time and joking, and Adrian Carmax uh, teasing American McGee, and American and, and uh, Michael Abrash is, is talking about the Beatles with me because we both like the Beatles. And um, and suddenly John Carmack, he's sitting there nursing his drink, and suddenly he'd he'd talk about some esoteric programming thing with John with Michael Abrash. Then Abrash would respond with the programming thing, and then um, then John, they would try. Then for a while they'd be talking about programming while the rest of us listened. And then Abrash would wrestle away from John Carmack because this is like he's not at work; he's having dinner. <laughs> we'd go back to having fun, and, and then right, and yeah. John Carmack would be waiting cautiously like a spider in his lair for the next time you could jump in and and steal uh michael a brash's soul with more programming it was <laughs> it was the hard. programming i mean you know he you know all he cared about was programming um and and that's probably what you needed to make uh it software work at the time well sometimes you do need those kind of single-minded like very focused people to to have big innovations like with doom and you know he's moved into obviously other fields. everything about john carmack is great, except that he did not force the company to have a leader, and I don't think he was aware of that failing in the company. Hmm. Well, yeah, so it certainly all came to a head, I suppose, during Quake. It didn't really come to a head. It was more of a gradual thing. Really what happened is that is that the intercompany spirit got so negative in, um, in Quake that, that I left and um, uh, uh, John Romero left, and Sean Green left, and American McGee left, and Dave Taylor left, and Michael Abrash left, and then a few couple of years later, uh, uh, Adrian Carmack left, and 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 if all those guys leave, what you have left is no longer actually its software; it's some other organization. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were barely 
any people from the original id for quite a while, I think. The only uh, people from the original that were left was John Carmack and Kevin Cloud. Uh, yeah. And I, well, and I, Adrian Comic was there for a bit, wasn't he, for Doom Three? And he was then, there for a bit, yeah. but he, but, 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 pretty much during Doom Three, he was at daggers drawn with uh, the rest of the company. It was pretty sad. Like, like they sued him. They mm. lost dismally because they were so inept at doing a lawsuit. There was there was this court case. They, they, it wasn't even the court case. Before the court case, what happened is they said, "Well, because you didn't do any work on the on on this game, we're not going to give you a bonus." And Adrian said, "I am a like a forty five percent owner of the company, and you can't deny me a bonus." And they said, "Oh yeah, we didn't do the work. So you're not getting it." So he said, "Huh?" So he got a lawyer because duh. And then they took it to court, and and one of the not John Carmack, but one of his one of the minions who didn't like Adrian got in front of the judge. This isn't in court. This is a pre hearing, and said, "Well, Adrian didn't do any work on Doom Three. And the judge said, "Huh?" So then Adrian got up, and he said, "Did judge? Did you know that every single texture that is used in Doom has a?" Um, has like a stamp on it showing who created it. And he said, really? He said, yes. Let's look at all the textures in Doom 3 wow. and see who created them. He and he'd done like 98% of them, right? right. And, 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 and the big lie technique that the other guy, that, that was being done was just so punk. The judge actually got like angry at their, at their lawyer. And then they brought in John Carmack and Carmack, of course, he's great. I love Carmack because he doesn't have any regards for human society. He sits in there, and the judge says, so what do you have to say about this previous guy saying Adrian did nothing? And John Carmack laughed and said, well, this other guy, I won't use his name, like, the truth is not always in him. And he kind of chuckled. And then, and then the judge kind of came down and said, said, if you do not give Adrian what he deserves, you could lose your company. And then Carmack realized that it was for real. He just he couldn't do just what he wanted. And then he, he then he made his agreement. And then Adrian took his money and went to uh, Ireland. Well, uh, good for Adrian, I suppose. <laughs> hey, at oh, least, no, uh... okay. Here's how great a guy Adrian is. So here's a really good example of how the three guys interacted. And remember, all these three men I regard as my friends and I admire them. So <clears throat> the first big money comes in for Doom 1, okay? So John Carmack takes his money and goes out and buys a Ferrari Testarossa. I remember, yeah. And he and he and he soups it up like a lot. Like he has um, nitro in it. He's got it so souped up that he can snap the the drive shaft anytime he wants by popping the clutch. He never did because he's a good driver. Okay, but he had this super car, and his his super car is in a. In a, in a parking lot at the apartment building he lives in where it's open to the elements in a, in a, in a city in Texas which has golf ball-sized hail. <laughs> Slightly so irresponsible, yeah. He's, right, yeah, well, he didn't even think about that, right? So he's got this amazing car. Then John Romero, who, one of the things I love about him is that he, he has a very childlike attitude towards the world, and at his best... That sense of wonder is super cool. He's super funny. I love to hang out with him. But sometimes, instead of just being childlike, it becomes more childish. And that's him at his worst. But at his best, he's, he's great. So, so he got a, a Ferrari Testarossa, too, because essentially because John had one, and he wanted to go. His isn't souped up. He didn't know how to do that or want to. He didn't want to pop the clutch and break his drive shaft. So Adrian, when the money comes in, he goes right out and buys a house for his mom. <laughs> Very okay. different. Yeah. So, so, three or four months later, okay, we're all upstairs at ID, and we look out the window, and there's a cobra in the parking lot. Not, not the snake, the car. Yeah. We're like a cobra. So that's cool, right? We're super impressed. We're like, who has a cobra? Who in this building is rich enough for a cobra? We're pondering and pondering it, and then we finally realize it's got to be Adrian's. And so we go into his office, and he says, "Yep, it's mine." And so. And we're like, show us your cobra. So we all go out in the parking lot and we're admiring Adrian's cobra. Because it's cool, right? 
And um, John Carmack didn't come. He came for a second, then he went back to his office because there's a computer there. And um, he looked at her for a little while, though. And then John, this is, this is funny, John Romero is standing there, and he's admiring the Cobra, too. And after, like, 15 minutes, he actually starts getting jealous. And he said, and these are his exact words. Hey, I have a cool car, too. Does anybody want to admire my car? <laughs> it was, like, two parts of the way. It was like, John, what the heck? Your car is cool, but we've known about it for, like, six months. But it was I mean, like, everyone was, was just trying to one-up each other with the cars. Well, uh, I don't think Adrian was trying to one-up one anybody, right? Right. Adrian just had the car. He, he, he only admitted it was his Cobra when we asked him about it. Because <laughs> he, he wasn't ever about that, but, you know, anyway, it was, it was funny. Hmm. So, Interesting dynamics the at the company. He bought a house for his mom the first time he got the money. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean... Stand-up guy, for sure. Uh, Here's uh, another story kind of showing what they're like. So years into it, before they kind of started falling apart in uh, into Quake, um, uh, John Carmack is watching Adrian do his bank account on his computer on his spare time. And John Carmack says, wait, how do you have so much money? Mm-hmm. And Adrian says, well, I saved it and I invested it in stuff. And it grew. And Carmack, said, and Carmack had basically spent all of his money. He hadn't saved any of it. Adrian, John That's Carmack. Interesting. I would have thought of John Carmack as being very frugal, but, but I, I mean, I guess not. Plan. He, doesn't, he wasn't planning on that kind of future. Right. That's why he did. That's why he took the big money he had later on and built a rocket with it. <laughs> well, that ended you up know? helping invest in his future. I'm sure. I'm sure, he did decently um, well. Anyway, it w- I thought it was pretty funny, and um, mm. yeah. So. Uh, all right. So to get back on track a little bit, back to Doom Two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, refueling base map ten. It was originally a Tom Hall map designed for Doom One, apparently. Uh, that ended up being used for Doom 2. Were there a lot of scraps of maps uh, to use that are left over from Doom 1, or was this one of the only instances of that? If you recall. I had a couple leftover levels from Doom 1, but really what it was is that there was... It was not so much that I I did more levels than I could use in Doom 1. It was that when we'd finalized Doom 1... So all the levels were done, except for polishing them. Then, like, all I could do is playtest. And we knew we were going to do them too, so I started spending time doing Doom 2 levels. Right. And, uh, you know, I just, like, I just never stopped. I, there's never a break. It's not like we took a month off or anything after doing, doing Doom, Doom 2. We just kept working because working at id was so fun that we didn't want to go anywhere else. Right. And if we took, we take vacations, but we wouldn't do, like other companies have been at. They say, "Hey, we finished this big project. Let's all take a break for two weeks." But that wasn't. We didn't. We just took breaks whenever we, when we wanted and didn't care about that. Mm-hmm. It was. I guess we were weird. <laughs> uh, so with um with downtown and, and suburbs, your big city maps. Uh, did you yes? With this. Were these just sort of built as like approximations of buildings and things, or did you actually look at at buildings and cities to see how to like construct something okay, that would so, work well as a so city? I don't, if you don't already know this, this is going to really impress you. Uh-huh. So suburbs, right? Yep. When I was designing suburbs, it's one of the early maps I did for Doom Two. While I was designing it, I was also building my house using my bonuses from Doom One. Right. I took the map of my house and used it for one of the buildings in the suburbs. You can go into my house in the suburbs and see it, at least the first floor. In addition, another house in it, the biggest one, if you look from above, is my dad's house that I grew up in. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is interesting. I didn't know that. It is absolutely 100% based on real houses. Well, only those two buildings, but that's enough, right? So, uh, in fact, I believe I have a level... Uh, an, an episode in my YouTube channel, which is Sandy of Cthulhu. Yeah, I'll put a link in uh, in the description of this one for sure. Let me see. Uh, Doom 2 Level 16 House Tour is what it's called. Uh, and right. what it is, is that is that it shows <laughs> Doom 2 Level 16 side by side with um, going through my house. And then it shows 
Doom 2 level 16, going side by side with my son going through my dad's house. Because my dad lives in Provo, Utah, and my son lives in Utah too, so he went through that. Mm -hmm. So you can see them. And the best part is, apparently, I didn't realize this, but when after, but when I did that 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 walkthrough, then it turned. Then some of the guys in the comments mentioned that early on, what, other people had heard that I based it on a on my real house, and a bunch of commentators said, "Well, obviously it can't really be his real house because it's, it's just too unrealistic." And then he said that comment has not aged well because it's exactly my house. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you can <laughs> still have the layout, but obviously, yeah, it's not going to look yeah. exactly like your house in Doom. But um, you know. There's a garage, you know, there's, uh, it has the garage. It had, I mean, there's changes. Like, for one thing, my TV is now against a different wall. The, there's not a TV in Doom, obviously, but there is a entertainment center, which is a hideous triangle thing with an eyeball in it, because what else would you look at if you were a demon, right? That's so, true, yeah, you look at the eye all night. Get, sit down with a, with a beer sit down and watch the, the eye. eye all day. <laughs> uh, map 21, Nirvana, uh bit of a polarizing map in terms of design. Uh, do you remember what the original concept was for that map? You had this strange opening with all the med kits everywhere, and then the progression's quite interesting with the teleporters and, and such. Do you sort of remember the original to, ideas? I, that was maybe the only level I did that I based around a title I thought of. I wanted to have a weird level that seemed all limbo-esque and out there, like you weren't really in hell or in heaven, but somewhere else. And right. so it was supposed to be a disconcerting map that's where you never knew really what you were and you're trying to get back to where you had to go. So that's what that map was based on. And I can totally understand people that didn't like it because it is, uh, I mean, it succeeded at being disconcerting. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that a more conventional map would have been better, but the way I see it is if every map's conventional, then how do you know when a map's unconventional? Yeah, I mean, my opinion is that I think if you're someone who doesn't like Sandy Peterson maps, then you just have to play more you Doom. You only really hate that map, unless you hate the Chasm more. But yeah, if you don't like Sandy Peterson maps, you will not like Lurvana. I think that's fair. I also tried to make that, that kind of cave part. It was really hard to do caves. And John, and John Carmack always hated it when I tried to do caves. <laughs> well, I think the more you play Doom, the more you enjoy Sandy Peterson maps, in my opinion. Uh, because well, they're think, very interesting. I mean, run through a Sandy Peterson map and it looks ugly. You're like, man, this guy makes ugly maps. And what can I say, you know? But then the third or fourth time you're running through a John Romero map, you're probably not admiring the art anymore. You're just trying to survive. And when you're running through the Sandy Peterson map, you're also trying to survive. So maybe you're not as impacted by the art and you can just see the whatever fun there is there. Well, I, I mean, I personally quite enjoy uh, your visuals. I, I like the abstract stuff in Doom. I think the engine does it quite well, so I think it generally works for me, personally. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, obviously I love my maps, but here's the other thing. <clears throat> I am fully aware of the fact that not all of my maps are equally good. It'd be crazy to say that. Obviously, some must be better than others, but I also think that which maps are better and worse kind of depends on the player. And for some players, I mean, I've had people say, the Chasm is my favorite map of all time, which I'm always amazed by, because I, I, I get know, so much I know on that quite map. a few, yeah. They love that map. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of people love that map. So obviously for those people, that, but it's not like there's a correct, the other thing is, there's not like there's a correct best and worst map in Doom, because it's, it's all very subjective. It's the map you love is the best map, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly. I mean, it is all subjective at the end of the day. Uh, Barrels of Fun, you, you touched on earlier. Uh, it's definitely an iconic map. Um, what made you want to like, use Barrels as a main design element for it? Was it just... To Basically, it came out of the, the boss level in Doom 1. Right, yeah. Where, I set up, where you're, when you're coming down the uh, elevator, if you shoot the barrels just right, it kills all the pinkies, and you can go on with your level. Yeah. And I, I just want to... Basically... I figured if I can't go nuts with that kind of idea in Doom 2, when am I going to do it? Because I'm never going to, right? Yeah, so exactly. this is my chance to have the ultimate barrels level. And that's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that map has, like, an arch violin and a mastermind, a couple of, like, quite a few high tier well, monsters. All kinds of terrible things. I was just, I was, I was trying to stretch the boundaries. Yeah. Were there rules for using, like, the higher tier monsters then? Like, it could only be every no. so, so many no, maps? Because no one was in charge, and, and the only person who would have put in a rule like that 
would have been John Carmack, and he didn't, so we just used monsters. Like, in fact, I wasn't going to use the high tier monsters until John Romero. I can't remember which level it was, but early on he has a level where he has a there's this big um like a stadium, and in the middle of it there's a cyber demon and a spider mastermind that start fighting each other. It's map twenty uh, of Doom Two. Is that what it is? Okay, but it was one of the first maps we did. Right. Yeah. Okay, it might be map twenty, but it was very early. So it's yeah, it is map twenty. Gotcha. And so, which, which by the way, um, I named basically all the maps mm-hmm. because someone had named the maps, and so it was me. <laughs> it turned out. Well, that's a good one. Well, I'm not saying that I did the best names. That someone had to name them, so there it is. So I'm. Uh, <clears throat> I might not have named um, level E1 M9 military base. That might have been John Romero, but. Uh, so even Doom really 1, you were naming most of the maps as well? Yeah, I was naming all the maps in Doom 1, too. There might be a couple that were named before me. Basically, it was all me. Interesting. So, because uh, someone had named them. And, and basically, anything that was boring and not that creative, I had to do. Um, so <laughs> You did make a lot I, of the maps for, for both uh, games. I made a lot of the maps for both games, and someone had to name them. And, and I had to name the monsters, too. Right? So I named the monsters... I mean, the Cyber Demon I didn't name. That's, that name was obvious from the start. But I, but I had to name the Mancubus and the Lost Souls and the Imps and the Demons and the, the, all those things. Um, so, but that's okay. It doesn't, it's not like the names or why you like Doom. Anyway, so he did... The, anyway, it was like this: the second or third level John Romero did for, for Doom 2. And it was the Cyber Demon and the Spider Mastermind. And everyone loved it. And so as soon as we realized that he could do that, then all bets were off. And from then on, we just did whatever we wanted. Right. So <laughs> Chasm, you touched on briefly, which, yeah, I suppose another polarizing map. Uh, what made you sort of want to tackle platforming uh, in Doom? Okay, so... Uh, I guess this website's dead now, but there used to be a website called Old Man Murray. Um, which was a really funny web site criticizing video games, mostly shooters. And in it, he said that one of the principles they said was that game designers are un- are unable to understand the simple human fact that zero people like platform jumping over lava. Here I am right now saying I hate platform jumping lava over lava, and I bet John Carmack's reading this in in the website, and 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 he sees I like ice cream because he can't understand this. So I thought that was pretty funny, but I, I saw that after I'd done the chasm. So I said, I guess I am not human. I like to play. All right. So, but the actual thing that, that the chasm came from wasn't platform jumping. It was, I had a nightmare. And in the nightmare, I was on these thin walkways over this endless abyss downward. And there was creatures on the walkways and around. I had to go along the edge of the edge of uh, a wall, then go out into the middle. And it was all based on the nightmare. I wanted to reproduce that nightmare. Making too many Doom maps giving you nightmares, sounds like. Well, uh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I know when I've worked too long on a single game because or because I start having nightmares about that game. Yeah, um, right, of course. So one of my worst nightmares about Doom was I was doing this level, and the way I did a level was I'd play it a little bit, then I would um, save it out, and, 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 like, make changes, go in, play it again, and go, go back and just, like, do iterations. So during the course of a day, I'd probably be playtesting through parts of a level, like, 20 times, and then spend the rest of the time building the level. So I, I had this dream, which I was in a Doom level, running around being chased by these monsters that we'd never had in Doom, huge elephant-like things. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, that were swinging balls. and sh- Anyway, it was scary monsters. So I'm running around, and there's... The section I'm running, and there's this pit of lava, and, I, and there's a bridge over it. So I ran over the bridge to get away from the monster, and I come back. But the way the level's arranged, I eventually had to come back to that area with the pit of lava and the bridge. And when I came back to it, the bridge was gone. And I realized that the designer of the level, who I knew was Sandy Peterson, had decided it was too easy to have stairs over the a bridge over the lava, and he'd taken it out, so I had to do a jump. So I was Sandy Peterson playing a Doom level being modified by Sandy Peterson to make it harder for me to survive. I don't know. I, I woke up and said, Freud I've say. been working hard on Doom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you you successfully spooked yourself with your own level, apparently. 
Um, speaking of spooky maps, map 28, uh, Spirit World, um, has very interesting texturing, and, and I suppose maybe harkens back to sort of uh, E3 of, of Doom 1. What were you sort of going mm. for here with the abstract sort of hellish uh, texturing for this one? It was another attempt to make a cave-like structure. Yeah. Because I always wanted to try that again. You know, it was always my goal in D&D, too, to have caves. And it's hard in D&D because everyone does their maps on um, on uh, uh, square grids. Right. Nothing ever is square. But there's no reason... You ha the only reason you make it in a square grid in D&D is because someone has to map your stupid level. Well, you don't have to map the Doom level. Why can't I have it be any way I want? So that's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And the make double masterminds, level. were they influenced by gotcha? The double mastermind was, was one of my pranks. Right. To entertain you. Um, because, you know, I like that kind of thing. <laughs> I wondered also the, the fake walls in that map. Was that ever sort of a point of contention during testing? That was a suggestion from John Carmack. Oh, interesting. He said, hey, you know what? We can have fake walls you can just walk through. I said, we can? He said, yeah. If you do it this way, then when you turn around and look out, you won't, it, won't be, it won't mess up with the, with the vision. So I said, going to use it. And if it hadn't been one of the last maps I made, it would have been on more levels. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. It's a big point of contention with people, the fake walls, so people can, can blame John Carmack for that, if they're upset. I mean, monsters actually shoot you through the fake walls, so it's not like you can't find them. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so I think I've heard you talk a little bit about the Icon of Sin before. Uh, was that... Was sort oh, of the gotta, I, I, what was the conversation I, I about the it? Condo. Sorry? The monster of the monster condo is also based on a nightmare of mine. I, oh, I have okay. a lot of nightmares where there a library figures prominently. That's interesting. And so the library section and the other things are based on that nightmare. This is a repeating nightmare I've had many times, which I will not go into detail now because I don't want to have it tonight. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to sleep paralysis arch file. I watch a lot of scary movies. I play scary games. So as a result, I get a lot of nightmares. And when I'm having the nightmare. It, it's not very fun, mm -hmm. but, um, but when, I, uh, when I wake up, I look back and say, oh, that was cool. I should, I can do something with that. Yeah, that's interesting being able to take something from that. Do you sort of write them down after the fact to remember them better? Uh, occasionally, usually I can remember pretty well. It, they don't fade in my mind. Right. Sometimes if, if I worry it might fade, then I'll write it down. Yeah. Yeah, I was, but, curi uh, I was sort of curious what the conversation was like regarding the Icon of Sin. Because uh, I suppose, I think I've heard you say that they wanted a big boss to end the game and, and such. Was, was that, um, well, was that basically that, I just knew we needed a big boss. Okay. Yeah. And so me and John Romero are talking about it. And we knew John Carmack would never let us have an actual giant big boss that did something. And I do not remember who came up with the idea of putting a big texture on the wall that you had to shoot. Right. Um, but, but I do remember that, that uh, uh, we had the big wall, and then we said, oh, it'll have a hole in the head. We'll shoot through it. And John Carmack, because his rules were, you had to have something for you to actually shoot. I mean, everyone's heard this story, but I'll tell it again in case someone in your group hasn't heard it. So yeah. there was an invisible... There was, it had to have a texture on it to exist. So... Um, so originally it was just like a, like gray, and then Adrian Carmack had the idea of putting John Romero's on a pole and have that be the thing you're shooting inside the inside the big monster because you couldn't see it unless you no clip through the level, right? Yeah. And then he actually gave it a one frame paint animation, mm -hmm. you know. So so he so he does so he so John Romero on a stick is in there, and so the <laughs> idea our idea was John because I was making the level and Adrian was did the art that Adrian and me that we were going to tell John Romero about it and he wouldn't find out until the game was released okay it yeah. was it was like just for fun but 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 that that Romero was no clipping through the level for some reason and he suddenly saw his face and he went back and he goes that's my head so he came, so he comes into the office where me and Adrian are, are talking and and he's laughing his head off it's so funny he, he was thought it was great so so then we said so then we decided, that's when we recorded his voice saying backwards, you know, to defeat Doom, 
he must kill me, John Romero. And that was mm-hmm. what the monster says. Because because yeah. John Romero, one of the things that Romero was 100% behind him being the boss that you kill. <laughs> and having to set up <laughs> stick. He loved that. So, yeah, uh, that's a great story, for sure. <laughs> but that was where it came from. It was all, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious what the thoughts were about sort of uh, custom content made by the community uh, after Doom 2 came out. Because TNT and Plutonia were sort of packaged together for Final Doom. Was there discussion of doing more of that kind of thing? Or, or not really? Um, basically, what would happen is that, like, Sean Green or someone would, like, want to do Doom maps. And so we like, sure, go do it. We were busy doing Quake. We didn't really pay that much close attention to it. Except that Sean Green was like John Romero's special buddy, so they, you know, he made sure to get his levels in. Um, I mean, I'd like to say that we had some master plan. Look, we were as surprised as anyone when uh, people started doing their own content for it. And the thing, but the thing that really blew us away was the Quake clans. When those appeared, like we'd never expected such a thing. That was totally new right. to us. That there'd be groups that were doing Quake. That was. We were really impressed. And of course, that just started the guilds that you have now. Yeah. You know, so. Just to, yeah, I do want to sort of touch on uh, Quake a little bit. Um, what were like some of the big challenges in terms of level design moving to a 3D engine uh, for you? Okay. So the worst part of it was that the way you build in Quake is you have to, you have this giant universe that you're not ever allowed to see or the engine will chug. So you have to build everything. So when you build a hall, you build a roof and a ceiling and a floor and the two sides, and you can't have any cracks. Then we were moving things around, we would always have cracks. And right. so, so you probably spent about a half year design time realizing that there was a crack in the level somewhere and trying to find it and close it. And we didn't have any tools to find those cracks. We literally had to go and like find it on our on our Quake ed editor, and right. and, so, and find a, like a one pixel wide thing where we'd slip to when we placed a, a mm-hmm. thing. So there so are a, lot more, a lot more bug testing and stuff involved with uh, Quake. There was a lot more bug testing. Yeah. So it was a good thing that we had a lot more level designers. And But you notice we all did a lot fewer levels. Right, yeah. Which it it must have been nice for you, who, <laughs> who had worked on so many levels for Doom 2 and now uh, Doom 1. It was, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Much harder to do levels. And yeah. so we all did fewer levels. Like, I only, I only, I, I did, like, what, six, seven levels on Quake? Seven, As opposed think, to the, yeah. uh, what, seven? I think yeah. so, yeah. I, I, yeah, but, but like, like, I did half a dozen levels, and in Doom 1 and Doom 2, over a similar time period, really, I had done, um, you know, like, almost 50 levels, or almost 40 levels. Yeah, 17 so for Doom 2, one, yeah. There's also the worst working environment that we had. Things got so bad on Quake that John that John Carmack actually started to notice the bad feeling, which was like it was he was it was tough for him to notice things like that because you know he wasn't prey to the weaknesses of normal humans. So he made us all go into one big office. He'd heard Bungie work that way, I think. And so right. we all are in one not maybe not Bungie, but someone. So we're all in one giant office where everyone is in the same room all the time, so that. I think his idea was that they could check to see if you were slacking off. <laughs> Maybe he thought it would but, be a nicer community experience, you know? You might have thought that, too. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's s- parts about it that would... Do, but it wasn't the way... It, I, it didn't bother me, because I never had an office anyway at it. I was always in, like... When you'd go into id, there'd be the side office with the artists. There'd be the, there'd be John Romero's little windowless room. There was John Carmack's room that actually had a window. You know, and then there was me in the big open hall with the pool table and stuff, like where everyone could see me whenever they walked past Donna. So I didn't care if I was in a big room or not, because yeah. I never got to have my own room. Um, mm-hmm. But that was fine. I didn't care. I was not there to to have an empire, but to do the game. Right. Uh, oh, well, uh, I I heard in an interview John Carmack did recently, actually, that he said that uh, looking back on it, uh, he thought that it would have been better, actually, if they'd split uh, the games into two, so that he would do a multiplayer-focused game in the Doom engine, and then Quake uh, later on in the development process to, like, make it less strenuous on the team. Do you think this might have made things easier than doing everything Quake demanded at once? 
I'm not sure. what you mean. You mean in so if we did Doom one and then Doom two the way they were, then on yep. Quake, if they done Quake and also like a Doom three multiplayer, is that what he's saying? No, he was saying they would do so. You finish Doom two and then they would do like the multiplayer aspects that ended up in Quake. They would do that in the Doom engine instead, and then they would make Quake uh, after that, so that there would be a longer production time for Quake, essentially. I mean, we worked on Quake for a long time. What what are the what are the Quake what are the Quake Quake uh, multiplayer things that he's talking about? Is he thinking about Quake three? No, I think I mean, this that was, was regarding all, Quake right? one. I think he was talking about how stressful Quake was for everybody on the team and how he would have rather sort of split it up. Quake, Quake was super stressful and it destroyed the company. I mean, I'm I'm willing to say. I mean. They made lots of money, but it literally destroyed the company in that everyone left, and they had to get all new personnel. And and that's the definition to me of how you destroy a company, right? It wasn't the same people. Yeah. Um, no one was as happy during it or as happy afterwards. And um, so really, Doom, Doom 2, and Wolfenstein, Doom, Doom 2, and Quake, what I, I regard as the classic id software stuff. And the other things are are good games with elements of the original team, but uh, but they aren't really the same guys. It's kind of like when uh, EA took uh, Crash Bandicoot away from the team that had developed it and gave it to a whole new team. Crash Bandicoot was never the same. Right, yeah. You know, that Spyro the Dragon, yeah. same thing happened to them. Mm-hmm. Of course, EA is famously famous at killing franchises, right? That's kind of their, <laughs> their, their deal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. It wasn't trying to do that, right? Because id for all its flaws, wasn't inherently evil, and of course EA is, is evil. Well, yeah, I suppose it's a different thing, right? EA is sort of, that's more of a corporate structure issue. Uh, it was sort of just um, maybe a group of talented me, people who right, came together I, but I, didn't I, know how to run like a, a company, like a we business. didn't know how to run a big company. We got a lot of money in a hurry, didn't know what to do with it. Everyone was acting kind of semi-selfishly. And then we got people that were starting to backbite within the company and, and uh, snipe at each other. And as soon as that happened, that was the end. Yeah, it must That's have been what, like, It was partway through during Quake when that occurred. We started having snipers, yeah. internal stress. And that's what killed us. Because mm-hmm. always before, if someone did something bad, they weren't bad. We had to look on how to fix it and make things better. And the guy would be trying to fix it too. But later on... If someone did something bad, then we had guys pointing fingers. He was bad, therefore I should get the bonus, kind of thing. And mm. uh, and that that's 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 death for the for what it used to be. And of course, that's what EA's whole functioning style is. But that's why everyone hates EA, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure some people like them. Uh, so, as someone who not sort people, of not people who are informed. Look, here's what I told my students when I taught for two years. Uh, game design at a, at a college for graduate students. I said, if you're not married and you get a job offer at EA, 100% go work for them. Go there. They'll work you like a slave. You'll make good money. And then when your project's done, you'll probably be laid off for the rest of your team. But when you go to your next company, when they see you've worked for EA, it'll be a great thing on your resume. Right. They'll know you had experience. They know you've seen the worst mm-hmm. corporate structure. And they'll and they'll know you know and you'll know you know what you're doing. So I told I did the same thing for Disney, which is also terrible. I mean, it's a bit of a problem, right? In in game development in general, and I suppose film and other things like that, where it's like, well, we're letting you do your dream job, so like we can treat you like garbage, you know. I, I feel like that oh, is look, look. a big we're, problem. We're right? we're dealing we're 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 doing a deal with actually it was uh, Ensemble Studios, and we were doing a deal, trying to do a deal with uh, the Star Wars guys, Lucas Arts, right. and and we were saying, and we're we're, we're we're basically the idea was we were going to do a um uh, a, a real time strategy game based on Star Wars, which I think actually came out, but we're, we're trying, to, but Lucas Arts comes in and they offer this super terrible deal, mm-hmm. and and we were saying we were saying what the heck, dudes, why is this deal so horrible? And they literally had the gall to say, well, you're working with LucasArts, so that's a little bit of the fairy dust. <laughs> and, right. their idea, and we were like, no. And then we just turned our backs, and they're like, no one turns their backs on us. And we did, and then they came back, and we got a better deal. But, uh, yeah, it must have been especially was- difficult uh, in the sort of 
earlier days with video games where like other industries probably didn't take it as seriously thinking video yeah. games weren't that big of a deal but you know how wrong they were oh another difference is that if hollywood is famously a bunch of a bunch of guys with super giant egos clashing all the time mm-hmm. right and underneath those giant egos are a bunch of people that work together like the cinematographer and the editors and the cameraman all those guys are, are working together as a team right? right well in computer games every Everyone has to be the team. You can't have the prima donna and be as effective, at least not in the long run. So you're all trying to work together always, and you can't have it. So when we encounter someone from an industry where they have the giant egomaniac, that it really seems alien and odd to us. Yeah. Uh, okay, so back to Quake. Um, uh, in terms of level design, uh, you t- again, this is something you sort of touched on a little bit earlier on, but as someone who enjoyed sort of making stuff with higher enemy counts and a bit more chaos did you struggle with quake sacrificing monster counts for like better ai and graphics and stuff ended up with like more monsters than ever before in the end but i but i I knew there was a lot of i I got a lot of hate for it because it was uh because it chugged the engine so much Mm. also also i had a whole guy attack me in a lengthy article because i'd used the formless spawn monster the jumping things because because we had, we had saved those for the fourth level for the fourth episode, and then I was the guy that everyone knew that my levels were wacky, right? So right. we so we did have an organization. We said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. It's gonna be we're gonna have each person's gonna each person's gonna do a different episode. So we had you know Tim and American and John and me, and they said you do the wacko level, Sandy. See, so you're getting the fourth one. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> I and so I was tasked. With making the craziest looking levels ever, which I did. Yeah, most, well, it's interesting because uh, in Doom you had a lot more abstract textures, lots more color to work with. Uh, was it difficult, yeah, sort of brown and gray, huh? Yeah. Did you struggle working with sort of these this flatter palette uh, of textures and stuff? You know, the, really, the guy to ask about that would be would be Tim or John or American who cared a lot. I just did what I just used the textures I had. I wasn't. Right, okay. You weren't looking to make sort of big statements kind of thing. No. I was trying to make strange levels. I mean, I tried to have, like, the weird blue lighting on some levels where you'd, like, I think as the Elder God Shrine, I did a lot of that, where you'd be like, um, uh, is the Elder God Shrine, is that the one where um, you, when you go up into the walls, there's, like, secret passages with blue windows? Or am I thinking of a different one? It might be. I'm definitely a bit less familiar with Quake than I am with Doom, so... Okay. Well, I tried to... I mean, basically, all through Quake, I was trying to... I was trying to have these really strange esoteric levels, trying to use the cool monsters, you know, um, that we now had quite a few cool monsters, and I was trying to figure out ways... the best ways to use the... uh, uh, the form of spawn. Yeah. But... uh, did you sort of have any hand in the... I mean, obviously, Quake and Doom aren't very story-heavy games, but did you have a hand in the, the story for Quake, being that it's got sort of that Elder Toro? writing the entire story in the manual for both Doom and Quake. Uh, and I, I, had, I had six pages of story for Doom, and I cut it back because it was too long and windy, and I cut it back because it was too long and windy, and I think at the end, there's like it's like two sentences, but that was all me cutting back on the story. Well, that's interesting. Did, would oh. you happen to have that around anywhere, the original kind of story? That was on my computer when I left. I'm sure they have it. But the thing is, I cut it myself voluntarily because, to me, the, the here's the thing. There's a lot of game designers who kind of regard themselves as n- not an id, okay? None of them like they're there. They kind of regard themselves as failed authors. Like, really, writing a book or a screenplay is the ultimate art, and games are just something right. to pass the time. Yeah, I, I don't view it that way. I think the game is a great art form in itself. And, and my creative impulses are fully served by doing games. But these yeah. other guys want to have a story. To me, the story you get from Doom isn't the story of the overarching thing that makes this great stuff happen. It is the story of when you pushed the other guy, you hit, knocked a rocket near him, so it knocked him into the chasm where there was two cacodemons, <laughs> and then they ate him. Yeah, exactly. And I was, I knew we were never going to have a long, complicated story. We, it didn't have the, have the patience to do that. So when, when um, uh, Valve came out with, uh, I can't think of the name. Half-Life. You know the one. Half-Life. 
with this fantastic story, then then it was great. I thought, yay, someone did it. Yeah. They have a great story with the game. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and of course, it did because it, the, it had a super bad case of, of NIH not invented here. So, uh, mm-hmm. so, they, so they, so <laughs> they, uh, they were like all whiny about how Half Life wasn't as good as what they'd done. But I was like, can't you respect them? Oh, we spent we spent a lot of time sniping it at um, Unreal Engine, for example, because well, obviously it's a, it's a real competitor for the Quake Engine, and rightly so. Yeah. And so they were like, here. But the reasons they gave for Unreal being worse were like the lamest reasons. Like one of the arguments they made was that Unreal was worse because instead of building your your um uh, your world like a bunch of Lego blocks sticking together, you carved it out from the inside of this big space that was dumb it's like why is that this anyway it was weird one of the good things about them doing that of course is they never had to worry about there being a leak in their level with unreal oh that's because there was no outer void in outside of them there was only like the big filled in space that's true yeah which is one of the so, things that you touched on as being sort of quite frustrating so with Quake. Even the level they did there was that level where it's on you're on a train Moving along, you fall off, you die, and they had a level that was kind of like um, D Day storming ashore, and they had all these great ideas. That I that and then when I talk about their great ideas, they would don't oh, know they're bad because they're not us. Um, right, sort of a not, a real yeah, right, want but, to be unique in the industry, I guess, and be the innovators. It's, it's kind of like fighter pilots. Fighter pilots have to think they're the best, or they can't do their job right. Even if they're not the best, they have to think they're the best. Because if you go into action as a fighter pilot thinking you're not the best, then you're just not. You're going to perform even worse, right? Yeah. So, so game designers and, and and developers have to think they're the best, and and uh, or else why even bother to be here? But also, at least designers have to be aware of the fact that other guys have things that are worth looking at to see how you can improve on them, to see how they improved on you. So when I when I got when I went to um. Uh, Ensemble Studios, me and the other designers had actually used to host special seminars where we'd see some other design and we'd have all the team get together and say, look at this other game, look at what they're doing. And they would say, that's not as good as ours. And we'll say, you're right, it's not, but look at this, that's clever. How can we, and we'd, and we'd look at the things that, that were good, we'd talk about things, that, and we'd evaluate it like it was something, like it wasn't just something to dismiss. And I think as a result of that, Ensemble Studios had a lot healthier opinion about other companies. Yeah, I think that's really important in terms of um, keeping your ideas fresh and and making sure that you're uh, like you iterating and not getting stagnant. Yes, but it doesn't just happen automatically. You have to actually do it. Yeah. Well, it's... So, and the designers did it because we played the most other games probably. Sure. Yeah. Speaking of Ensemble, uh, I did want to touch on that too. Uh, did moving sort of two ensemble studios from id did that feel sort of like coming home a little bit to like your strategy game roots because you sort of started with civ and, and sid myers and stuff well i mean i guess the, the main thing that you perceive when you're in a game company is the company personality the game companies have personalities okay yeah. in a giant company like um like microsoft or ea the the company as a whole might have a personality but really the person Personality is your team's personality in that case, right? Sure. So, for example, when I was at when I was at Ensemble Studio, sorry, when I was at Micropro Software from '88 to '92, the personality was a lot like a fraternity house. Uh-huh. Like everyone's buddies, we hang out, we play things together. We're like, you know, we we're uh, you know we're friends, you know, college buddies. Yeah, uh, we, we kind of we're not really working together because our teams were so small. But we know what each other's doing. We're kind of working in parallel. Then id Software was the best way I can explain it. Is id Software was like a nature documentary about a bunch of uh, hyenas eating a zebra, and they're snapping and barking and, and snarling at each other, and it's not very pleasant to watch. But it's a pretty efficient process, and the zebra vanishes with speed. So that was kind of how it was there. Right. No, no one's in charge. It just is happening. And then Ensemble Studios was like, like literally like a family. Right. brothers and sisters we'd like one of the rules we had to hire someone new at ensemble studio that, that that was eventually we started consciously saying i didn't come up with the idea but they said if the elevator 
broke down in our in our apartment in our building and you were stuck in an elevator with this guy for three hours would you have interesting things to talk about and and everyone we hired had to pass that evaluation in our head you know and one of the results of that was that it was very rare for people to quit ensemble studios once you once you got a job it was really hard to get a job there probably too hard really Mm. because we had trouble getting personnel like it took us three years to get a um an art lead because we just couldn't art manager because we couldn't figure out how to get one but but once you got a job there then you never wanted to leave because everyone there got along so well that, that you felt like your bosses actually cared about you because they did you never felt that way at uh at micropros and uh, id software didn't really have a boss because the boss i mean there was a guy in charge jay is in charge of the company but but really it's, it's carmack it's the carmacks and the romero that run everything and they're just yeah. developers but uh here, here's here's how great the bosses were at ensemble studios okay mm-hmm. in uh we're, we are working on uh, uh the game titan which is going to be the huge gigantic um MMO that will make Microsoft a billion dollars. And that's not a random number. That's the number that Microsoft and we conservatively figured out it would make. I mean, it's a giant MMO backed by Microsoft, designed by designed by Ensemble Studios. It's going to be hit. It's, I mean, Ensemble Studios never did anything that sold less than a million, than three million copies. And then a tie-in okay. with Halo as well, right? So. It was tie-in with Halo as well. Who, would, who wouldn't want to play a game in space in the Halo universe where it's as an MMO? You know, we had all these ideas to make it even better. So anyways, everyone's excited about the game. Then, um, for reasons I won't get into here, uh, a a evil man at at, uh, Microsoft named Don Matrick decided to to get rid of us, and his plan was to lay us off after we finished Halo Wars. So uh, our bosses go, they know something's up, so they go to Microsoft headquarters in uh, Washington, and they're sniffing around, and Microsoft's too big to actually keep a secret. Yeah, it's like twenty four thousand. They can't keep any secrets if you start. So, so pretty fast they found out what was going to happen. So then, um, Microsoft panics because they really want to get Halo Wars because it's going to sell three million people, three million copies. It's going to be a major release for the Xbox, right? They they can't Xbox. They can't afford to have us go. So here's what they do: they go to our bosses and they say, "Okay, when we lay off all of our Ensemble Studios, we won't lay you off." And you will stay working for Microsoft, and in fact, you will get raises, and you can stay here forever. And to a man, every single one of our managers resigned on the spot. Wow, that's incredible. And and then Microsoft really panicked, and they said, "We're going to lose Halo Wars." And so then they say, "Wait, wait, wait, back up, back up." And then they basically started said, "We'll figure out something. Just keep." So for this couple, so they came back. Our bosses didn't, in fact, tell us about that that conversation because because they were now in active negotiations with Microsoft to figure out some kind of breakup deal where we wouldn't get totally screwed in the shorts. Mm-hmm. And, but they didn't tell us because they knew if we knew that Microsoft was going to lay us off, then like we'd start quitting, and then the yeah. people who were remaining wouldn't get a good deal. So I'm kind of torn over that. That, that I could, I can't decide if I wish they told us or not. I see why they didn't tell us. Uh, um, but I kind of feel that they owed it to us to let us know because we're big, we're big boys. We can make our own decisions. But in the end, what happened is they didn't tell us. But they were it was a problem for them. They had two bad choices, right? So yeah, they exactly. made a deal. They made a deal finally, and here was the deal: was that we would be that we we were all laid off at the end of February, mm-hmm. and and that and that when that happened, there was two, all the company was going to divide it into two groups. There was a third of the company, about maybe a little less, that was going to go on to form Robot Entertainment. That was going to include all the all the managers of Ensemble and and the uh, the developers that they thought would be the best ones to work to be in Robot Entertainment with them. I was not one of those developers, and I think they made the right choice taking Ian instead of me. He he's the right guy for a startup, <clears throat> and um, and and then they would get a deal from like. From Microsoft, where they basically Microsoft had to fund the next three and a half years of, of production, and then everyone else would get eight months of severance pay. But the guy staying with Robot would not get that severance pay. So they actually arranged a deal which was better for the people that our bosses were not going to still be working with. Right. So those those are stand up guys. 
Yeah. And and I and uh, you know and so I'll always I I remember them with uh, 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 with with the great love. I they're still my friends. I see them sometimes, and uh, it you know anyway they were they were fabulous. Yeah, I mean it sounds like a very good work environment for sure. Yeah, Especially and then Halo for the games industry. Top. Microsoft was happy too. And then Don Matrick got got kicked out on his ass after Xbox <laughs> Live kind of he bungled the start of it. So that was good too. Well, they go vindicated in the end. Uh, so as a, I, I don't think it was bad for the industry. We all got laid off because it's not like they killed us. Like we got robot entertainment, boss fight entertainment. I found Peter. We all were scattered around through the universe and made and did other and seeded other companies or founded other companies. So I think the gaming world as a whole is better off because of what happened. Right. But yeah. I still kind of miss not seeing Titan because that would have been cool. Well, I guess, yeah, and also, I'm sure more iterations of Age of Empires could have used the original sort of crew as well. Yeah, sure, I mean, we would, like, they're just doing the same things again and again, they're adding new, new factions to Age of 2. We would have gone on to uh, World War Two. Right, yeah, because uh, that was, I remember seeing artwork originally that showed uh, that you guys were going to do... Uh, after Age of Empires 3, it was going to go sort of chronologically and come more, like closer to modern day. Right, and in fact, we ha- in in the in the age eight in the in the, in our uh, art book we did at the very end, it shows age one, age two, age three, age four, and age five. Age four is World War Two, and age five is in the future. But then we did the Halo Wars for our future, but we didn't ever yeah, get right. to do the age four. Yeah, very interesting. I was super excited for that because I love World War Two. Yeah. I mean, I mean it okay, fascinating. I think it was a terrible catastrophe, but I love games about it. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you mean. Historically fascinating, <laughs> but obviously horrible. Yeah, someone will like put, quote me online. Sandy Peterson loves World War Two. It's like okay, yeah. that's not really the case. His favorite. War. I mean, it almost it almost killed my my uncle, you know, and uh, and it did shoot my other uncle. He lived though. Oh my! And it almost killed my two, my uh, my beloved uncle Mike and my beloved Aunt Lillian, who were both Japanese. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't think anyone's going to be uh, misconstruing you too much <laughs> when you say you love World War Two. But um, as a so as a lead designer for Age of Empires, I've read a bunch of interviews and heard you say that balance was like such a huge focus for you. Huge, uh, huge process. Yeah, we didn't worry about balance in Doom and Quake because you only had to be able to win the level, yeah. and you were always balanced against other players because you had the same weapons available. But in, uh, in us, in, uh, in, uh, we had to, every Civ had to be different in uh, Age of Empires. Yeah. So I was in generally tasked, starting with, with Rise of Rome, I was doing almost all the balance. Or if not, I was in charge of all the balance, and I did the vast majority of the balance for all the rest of the things. So I learned to get pretty good at balancing. And, and did I do it perfect? I'm sure. Sure, that people will find things that they don't think I did good. I have a troll that always goes online when I say anything about Age of Empires and says, "You ruined Age of Empires one when you did Rise of Rome." So this guy is still bearing a grudge from 1997. Wow, that's mad. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, well, I was I was gonna sort of point out how well balanced Age of Empires two is in particular, and I was wondering if it's like very vindicating to see that the competitive scene is still going strong today. I love that people think it was well balanced. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy about that. I think it was much better balanced than Age 1, which is still pretty well balanced, mind you, but Age 2 was really well balanced. Age 1 was not, didn't have as much of me balancing it, so it makes me gratified secretly that Age 2 is better. Right. Then I, you know, <laughs> and, and then Age 3 is also, I think, pretty well balanced. Mm. Uh, and were you guys thinking about the competitive element of the game in terms of, like, you know... Obviously, esports wasn't really much of a thing uh, back then. Oh, sort no. of just starting Doom, out. Bro, Doom showed the way. When Doom came out, that was the first game ever that everyone was playing online. Yeah. Because I worked on other games before them where we tried to do things online, and we were just thwarted. No one ever bought them. No one ever. They didn't work. But at Doom, it did, and that wasn't that was serendipitous. We didn't plan that. It did. It just happened. Yeah. So, Age of Empires came out. Everyone said yes. You, we don't. We didn't. We had to have it. We knew we had to have some kind of campaign, but we knew that the game, in its heart, was going to be playing against other people, and uh, yeah. that's what we were concerned about. Because mm-hmm. that was the fun way to play Warcraft, right? So we wanted to have uh, that be the case. 
So, in fact, um, playing against other people was it from the start. That was the core. The core. Uh, that was concept. the core idea of Age of Empires from the very beginning. It was playing against others, and our and our, we had so many playtests. In fact, I didn't even watch the playtests. For the campaigns, what, what, what the the way the campaigns were, I was in charge of the campaigns usually, and I would these are the scenarios. I, I basically say, here's the historical situation. Have a game that does these. Have a battle that does these things, and then players will think it's the historical thing, and mm -hmm. then you do whatever you want. Then I have the designers that do that. Then they would watch those tests, and um, but we didn't care if those were balanced because it's single player. And then I would go watch the tests when we have like eight people all at once playing. Uh, Eight different civs to get each other and trying to see if they're balanced. Yeah, and I, I'm curious. I've heard you sort of talk about how you balanced uh, the different units against each other, but I, what about in terms of like map design? Uh, where did the balance come in in terms of that? Like having resources equal for both players well, and, and stuff. One was we had to make sure that the map was fair to all the players. Okay, yeah. and the other was that that you didn't run out of some resource because if you ran out of a resource. Then, then that was usually worse for some civs than others, and it made an imbalance. Yeah. Like if your like if your map had a ton of gold, then some civilizations really benefited from that more than other civs. Yeah, of course. So you had to watch for that, you know. Um, and we couldn't do things like have a have a, a guy who had super. I mean, we could give, we could give a guy that had advantages on the ocean. But if the advantage of the ocean were too big, and that was then so much so you weakened his land, then you had a sieve that couldn't function on an all land map, and yep. so you had to worry about that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there was we well, the, we balanced it in in, in uh, three ways. Uh, we had uh, we had a special playtest team composed, and there was a core playtest team of four guys that were super super good, yeah, at playing uh, the game, and, led by the sheriff, uh, Kevin Holm. And I was, in, I was in charge of... Kevin was like my buddy. We worked together in the same office quite a bit. And so, so those guys would get there and they would play, they would play the high-end, super tough games just against... Nobody else could compete with these guys, right? So they just played against each other. And we'd watch them and see how those things went. Then we had the regular games in which the artists and the programmers, the designers are playing against each other like, like normal human beings would play. And we'd watch <laughs> for the balance there. And, uh, and then we had the testers also, when they weren't doing the regular testing, we would have them do tests of, now we must have a thousand longbowmen against a thousand paladins and see who wins. Right. And they would do like those kind of boring tests on the tactical level. And uh, then, I, then, then my, uh, my, my, ch my charge was, first, to make sure it kind of matched historical reality. Second, that it was fun for the mid-level guys. We didn't care as much if it's fun for the high-end guys, because once you get to that end, like the extreme skill players, they aren't playing it for fun anymore. They're playing it for blood. And, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. And so that became hard because there were some units that were hard for a normal person to use, but were super powerful if it high... Like, for example, the horse archers. Like, yeah. a normal guy can't micromanage well enough to use the horse archers to the best result, but Kevin Holm and the other guys, they get these horse archers and literally dance rings around you. And you couldn't do anything about it. You, your shots never hit them because they're microwing. And so we had to decide if we were going to balance it so that the high-end guys were, were balanced using horse archers or if the middle-range guys was. We decided the mid-range guys were most of the players. So we balanced it for them. And so what happened that the high-end guys, when they had a choice, they would mostly do horse archer sieves where they get micro. We were okay with that. Yeah, that must have been tough. I mean, so many different civilizations, so many units within each civilization, yeah. map and design. Then, and, then yeah. got, and then in age three, when we had way bigger civ differences, and then when I did, um, when they had me do the the uh, the war chiefs, when I added um, really powerful, like the civs were to, were more like age of mythology. They were totally different yeah. in the war chiefs. We had civs that didn't have cavalry and civs that didn't have gunpowder and civs that could turn their soldiers invisible and it was just this crazy stuff so that was super fun i'm curious as someone who worked on asian mythology i feel like it's a game that didn't get picked up quite as much as uh, age of empires and age of empires 2 it wasn't quite as popular uh, i really loved it personally maybe because age i loved mythology, mythology stuff, sold really really well yeah but the thing is age of on age of empires 2 was like a uh 
was was like, was like this miracle thing. It, it did it did so incredible incredibly well that everything else seemed crappier by comparison, even if it wasn't. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Age of Mythology earned thirty two million dollars in four years. I would say anyone would count that as a win. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. But. But no, it didn't sell as well as Age of Empires 2, which Age of Empires 2 was just, like, caught on fire. Right. Right? I guess so, I, like, yeah. Halo Wars sold, I think, yeah. I so guess it I'm, seems worse, sorry. but it's just, nothing's going to be Halo, Ensembles is going to be Age of Empires 2 again, unless you catch fire again. So we just made, so we made games, so, oh, poor us, we only made, our game only sold $8 million a year, you know, for Age of Mythology. And then Age, Age of Empires 3, let's see... Age of Empires 3 sales, like, it sold, like, 2 million copies, I think, mm-hmm. which is probably, like, $100 million at the time. Yeah. So, Age of Empires 2, 3 did great, but, again, it's not, I mean, Age of Empires 2, in the day, was, like, 10, 16 million dollars, 15, some huge amount, so it was just unthinkably high. So, so that was kind of bad for us, because Microsoft was, like, how come your games are selling so poorly? And we're saying, okay, so Age of Empires 3 and Age of Mythology literally outsold every other single game that Microsoft Game Studios did put together. <laughs> How are we doing poorly? Well, it's not Age of Empires 2. I said, what is? You know? <laughs> yeah, the burden of success almost, I suppose. Burden of success, that's exactly what it was. It's yeah. kind of like when Orson Welles' first movie was Citizen Kane, which was then has right, been on the yeah. list of 20 Like, he's screwed. He can't ever go back to that. But almost <laughs> Owen Brothers, when they did Blood Simple, everyone said, they're another Hitchcock. They're the best. And so the Coens said, we're screwed if they go another Hitchcock. Because, you know, so then the next movie were raised in Arizona, which is so totally different. They no longer were Hitchcock. Yeah. And the well, Coen Brothers movies. Uh, yeah, I suppose it must have been a challenge. Because I always think of Age of Mythology as, um, I mean, it, it's a big shift graphically. And, Age of uh, Mythology did worse than Age of Empires 3. Right. Okay. And it did worse than Age of Empires 1. So of our four big, and I think it did worse than Halo Wars, so of our four major RTS releases, it did the worst. But doing the worst and selling like a million copies is still not like it was it was not a failure. Yeah, it was right? still a big success. I mean, yeah, yeah like I, I said, say, I, lo- I definitely love that game a lot. It was very good. I mean, like, like, um, like I would say that Doom Three, I think, is the is the suckiest game that that it ever made. But commercially, it was still a success. Mm. You know. Well, I just, quite liked Doom Three for not as no, a Doom game. No, I, I, think, I didn't. Uh, I thought it was. I thought it was kind of lame, but <laughs> it's not up to me. You know. I think it's not really. A, uh, you know, a lot of people have the same sentiment of it. It's not a great Doom game, but but it's still quite an enjoyable experience. Just uh, not not very Doomish. Uh, in the way it's I presented. Guess. I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, right. Um, so you have sort of talked bits and pieces about Halo uh, Wars, uh, and as a huge Halo fan myself, um, I'm curious what it was so, like working with. So what happened is that um, one of the programmers decided that he one of the one of the bad things about being a game designer. In, uh, is that a lot of people who have other jobs like artists or programmers think mm-hmm. that being a game designer is trivial because they have to do game design too. And they do. A good programmer is also doing game design. A good artist is also doing game design. So they're doing game design as well as other stuff. Game designers unique features that we're like only doing game design, you know. But they kind of feel like it's like it's better than programming. It's want to be a game designer. So so basically, a one of the art, one of the programmers decided he wanted to be a game designer, and then and be in charge of the whole project. And then he kind of bungled it. He 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 wasn't he wasn't doing his diligence. Like we had one programmer come to us, Tim Dean. He was great. He said, "I want to be a game designer." And I said, "Okay." So Tim spent a year building levels, doing um, like making maps. You know, and and he he spent six months trying to figure out the interface for Halo Wars, which he did a great job. That was Tim Dean. And he did all this stuff so he actually had the chops. He had put in the time to learn what game designers do, besides the normal stuff they do. 
Mm-hmm. And he was a good designer. But the other guy didn't do that. He just like thought he'd be on top and, and wave his hands and things would happen. And so it was going along and it was really slow. It was like frighteningly slow. And he had this, he, his idea kind of was that the game would have this awesome battle between Martians invading Earth and all this stuff. And then finally, like, we had to get it, like, there became a wave in the company, which I was part of, saying, why are we doing this whole other um, IP? Why don't we just use Halo? It's a science fiction game with aliens fighting humans. Why don't we use Halo and have that be the RTS? And the, uh, the part of the team that was doing the, R- the, the, the space RTS game fought back, saying, no, we have our artistic vision. And I'm like, game, I mean, whatever. Halo Wars, if it was Halo, it would sell better. And it's a perfectly good... Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I've been a game designer since uh, uh, 1980... Sorry, sorry, 1980, right? And up until 2013, I did exactly one game that I picked the topic. Every game I did, someone else picked the topic for me. And I was fine with that because I always made that topic mine. I found things to say about it that would be mine. I think you can say that I put my stamp on Age of Empires. I put my stamp on Doom. You know, all those things have my personality on them because I I, I adopted it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But I didn't. But but th- but these guys were new. They were like, no, they're wrecking my artistic the things. They didn't like that. So basically, the 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 guy who was officially the designer went to his room and spent eighteen months writing the script, which is, I thought he I, I thought he wasn't doing his job at all. Right, letting uh-huh. the game happen around him because he was so depressed because they weren't using his original brilliant Martians versus humans thing. So anyway, we did it, made it be Halo Wars. And I guess, and, and Tim Dean, who was also on that team, liked it being Halo Wars. So we put Halo in, but because we'd kind of gone in late with it as, as the changeover, and because there was a resistance from the team in making the change, then what happened is we didn't have time to have the Flood be a separate Civ, which was the original idea, which mm-hmm. I think is bad, because the Flood would have been a great Civ to play. Yeah, that would have been very unique. Uh, so it came, So the original concept for Halo Wars came from your side of the studio, not from Bungie. The idea to make it Halo Wars came from our side of the studios. Then we went to Bungie and and Microsoft and got it. Mm-hmm. And the bosses agreed with us. It's obviously a good idea, right? Yeah. I mean, who cares who the aliens? You have the same plot. It doesn't matter who the aliens are. Right. Anyway, well, sorry, Bungie I'm... also famously made um, RTSs before they got into Halo, uh, as well. So it shows in Halo. Definitely. Um... A perfect marriage, I think. World building and the way things work, it shows. Here's the thing. I mean, I guess I'm I'm, I'm bitter about it, so I shouldn't talk anymore about it. But <laughs> but because there was that kickback, made Halo Wars take a year and a half longer than it should have, and that was what let Don Matrick have enough chops that he was able to fire, laying us all off. Mm. Because if we'd had Halo Wars out a year and a half earlier, like we could have, then even, even he wouldn't have dared do it. And that means that we could have had Titan, which I was in charge of all the creative for, so, and the world building. On the other hand, instead, I got to teach game design for two years and graduated something like 200 designers who all listened to me, talked to them for a long time, and then I got to found Peterson Games. So, you know, thanks, Don. Yeah, I mean, still worked out, for sure. Yeah, I did. I got eight months separate pay. Uh... So what was the collaborative process like with Bungie then? Were you were they sending ideas back and forth or they just sent us rules of art. They said this is what forerunner forerunner stuff looks like. Yeah. This is what um covenant stuff looks like. Make sure it matches this. Like yeah. forerunner stuff was all 45 degree angles. That was one of the rules. Mm-hmm. You could you couldn't have like a like an angle that wasn't 45 or 90 degrees. I remember that. And uh they explained how hard light works, that kind of thing. But other than that, they didn't really care. They said, kind of do whatever you want. Because Bungie is a creative group, too. So they knew we had to be able to do what we wanted. Yeah. So we'd do something like, say, hey, we're going to have giant scarab-like monsters do things. And they said, sure, I'm sure the company has something like that. It's not something they would use in Halo, because you don't need a giant scarab monster. And you presumably know? they would want to come up with the, the names and, and certain lore aspects. I, would imagine. I mean, they didn't. When we added something new, we named it, and they just, right? But here's the thing. So we had the giant scarab monsters because the Martians had giant scarab monsters in the original game. So then we just changed the art and put them into Halo. Right. 
And did you have like a lot of specific law restrictions then for, for things that you could no, do within the game? Not, no, no one was really good about that. Oh, okay. Interesting. So it was quite a free form experience, really. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they got to approve everything. Yeah. So so everything before they would look at it, and then mostly they, I mean, because I wasn't directly involved in that game at the time, I only did some of the playtesting. I didn't, um, I don't I don't know if they sent things to the art leads and stuff on, on Halo Wars and made them change stuff, but uh, I mean, I saw art change in the game to get better, but I don't know if it was just our artists making it better or if it was them. Right, okay. Interesting. Well, I mean, you, you've definitely worked on a lot of uh, completely different games <laughs> from so many different yeah. franchises. Well, the Where... funny thing is, I got, when I got hired at, at Ensemble Studios, the artists at Ensemble really, really like shooters. Right. They play shooters after hours. Everyone loves shooters, right? Who doesn't love shooters? Yeah. So they love shooters. So they had it in their mind that I would eventually do a shooter with them because they always they all wanted to work on a shooter. Uh-huh. And so I was I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't mind. I mean, I love shooters. So, but we never actually got around to it. So we never did the ensemble studio shooter. Was Titan going to be an FPS MMO or was it third person? Titan. Yeah. Is um, that going to be first person? We never, I think we wanted to see our guy. Right. I think it was going to be third person or second person, whatever you call the thing where you see your dude. But you could zoom in to see to be first person. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering because if it was sort of the beginnings yeah, of Destiny. Or or craft that we liked is you could buy craft to look decorated and cooler, and they could see you looking cooler. Yeah, of course definitely an important aspect of those types of games <laughs> so you can sell hats later on you know yeah well i mean we weren't we weren't thinking about the hat thing but you know we probably should have been mmo fans are thinking about the hats let me tell you they love hats we were just thinking about how to make it fun <laughs> yeah of course uh well to bring it squarely back around to doom for the final question which i, I ask everybody who comes on this podcast uh, what is your favorite Doom monster and why? Um, my favorite Doom monster. Yeah. In appearance or tactically? Uh, if you can choose one for each, if you want, if they're different. The coolest looking Doom monster is one hundred percent the Spider Mastermind. It looks great. Yeah. Coolest monster is, however, the Archfile. Because yeah. it has something, it's so interesting and gives you so many different tactical things. And also, it's outright terrifying. Like the first time you see a cacodemon, you're kind of scared, but then you're then you're not afraid of him anymore. But every time you hear that and, hear, and, and the and the fire starts building up to explode you from the arch valve, you're frightened. So that was a real hit. Yeah, absolutely. And that comes with your uh, they're good for your sort of suspense uh, element yeah. as well. Uh, that yeah. build up of the fire and having to move behind objects. And, and, and because they're rare, because they're really rare, it's always a surprise when one shows up. Yeah, exactly. Which is also good. Mm -hmm. Good choice. Uh, definitely a common choice. Uh, people pick that one a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a fan favorite for sure. If, if I couldn't pick that one, it would probably be the, uh, the Mancubus. Because yep. he looks so great. And everyone thinks he's talking about your mom. Right, I think it's just pig sounds or something, isn't it? It is. It's a pig. It's a pig grunting as he eats. It, yeah. well, well, that's what I was told by Bobby. Right. 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 Uh, I, I suppose. Would... Uh, I'll ask you as well because uh, you know, Age of Empires is also a huge part of your uh, career. I'll ask you what your favorite Civ is uh, in Age of Empires as well. Okay, so tragically. My favorite Civ in Age of Empires at the time was always the Civ that I was having the most trouble with because I spent the most time trying to fix them. <laughs> right. but, but now that it's all in the past, I'm going to say that my favorite Civ is probably either the Sioux or the Aztecs because mm. those were fun to design. Although I got... Uh, and they were the least like the regular Civs. I remember when I first was doing my Indian civs, people were like, the Indians are going to be bad because they don't have good guns. They don't have good... They suck. And then the very first civ I finished for for the War Chiefs was the Iroquois. 
and they start and immediately they became they became super popular among all the testers. Everyone loved the Iroquois. Right. And uh, and so I said, why do you love it? And they and the one of the reasons that we give is because you ha- have a bunch of super little chappy creep, chappy cheap, uh, crappy cheap, <laughs> civ civ engines or, or or siege engines that you can send into that and destroy his town. And that was it. And the Sioux were fun because I just I just love the Sioux, you know. Every time I watch a Custer's Last Stand movie, I want to ride down with the Sioux and and uh, shoot everyone, you know. But uh, and the Aztecs are, I don't know, all those are great. I guess the Aztecs have the panoply with all the weird warriors. Right, and the yeah. Cool. But the Sioux, you know, there's something about the Sioux. I guess I'm torn. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's not the cool. If, if I mean, you were not so many, it must be If tough. I have to pick age two, instead, it's the Huns. Right. Uh, is that just because of that unique element of uh, with the housing? Yes, which I had to fight for. Really? Was it seen as maybe becoming too imbalanced or something? What happened is they said, you shouldn't just have it be free. You should have it cost like one wood or something or ten wood. Have it. Be, I said, crappy little changes aren't fun. Big changes are fun. They said, no. We should. So, But then I got just I got vindicated. Uh, what happened is that we uh, we the programmers wrote a bug into the game by accident where you had to build a house even if um, you were the Huns, but it cost zero. We right. still had to build it. Okay. So suddenly everyone had been playing the Huns and whining to me about how the Huns were unbalanced. It, was, it wasn't like <laughs> this. Then they had to start building the houses. And immediately that day, the same people who'd whined so much came to me and said, okay, you're right. We, 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 uh, we got housed every single second play of the game because we got it was so fun not to have houses and it shouldn't have houses so we balanced it other ways and that taught yeah. me a lesson that i did on my new on my game cthulhu wars which is that the most fun for a sieve isn't a sieve where you feel like you're balanced in keeping with the other sieves it's a sieve where you feel you have some gross imbalance some ability they don't have and you're the best even if they have something that makes them the best too so they're actually balanced yeah so in Cthulhu Wars, I've had a lot of guys tell me that you feel like you are the most powerful guy, and if you can only get all your ducks in a row, no one can stop you. The only problem is other guys are getting their ducks in a row too. Yeah. So that was so that's what taught me that, and that's what I tried to do with the with the war chiefs too. Having those civs feel like if they could pull it off, you know, they'd be kings. Yeah, uh, it really harkens back to what you were talking about very early in the podcast about empowering the players, like first and yeah. foremost. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You want to empower the player. Mm-hmm. Uh, and have them feel like they are the mighty guy. And if they're and if they're defeated, they're defeated not because their units were bad or the game designer was bad, but because you, Nirvana, were bad and you defeated him by by being evil and cunning. And next time I'll beat you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well that's what right? Yeah. I mean you definitely want the player to be able to look back and be like, Well, I made a mistake here. Uh, you know, you want them to understand that uh it was their own fault and not necessarily just the game being unfair. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. All, the player should always feel like it's his fault. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, on that note, uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great having a chat. Uh, thank you for giving me so much of your time as well uh, for the interview. Um, yeah, this is a three-hour interview. Yeah, two and a half, I think. It was a big one. Um but very enjoyable. So if, you want, and, um, well, if you want to do this again in a year or so, or even sooner, who knows, then I will be around. Oh, that's fantastic, um, yeah. I mean, maybe it would be great to like have you on and talk more specifically about Age of Empires, or you've done so many games in your, your career that it was tough to cut down these questions. I already had a lot of questions, but uh, <laughs> I had to cut them down. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely love to have you back in the future. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Well... Thanks again, and um, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, I'll be back next week with another episode. So, uh, yeah, thanks again to Sandy, and and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.